That's it. Good morning. Can I welcome everyone to the Justice Committee's 34th meeting in 2013. Please switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices completely as interfere with the broadcasting system even when switched to silent. No apologies have been received. Item 1, the agenda, continuing our evidence of the Criminal Justice Scotland Bill. It's our sixth day of evidence at stage 1. And we're hearing from this panel of witnesses on corroboration and related items. Can I welcome to the meeting Robin White, Vice Chair of the Scottish Justices Association, Raymond McBenamin, Solicitor Advocate and Member of the Criminal Law Committee of the Law Society of Scotland, James Wolfe, QC, Vice Dean of the Faculty of Advocates, and Mark Harrower, President of the Edinburgh Bar Association. Welcome to you all. Good morning. And we go, thank you for your written submissions, by the way, and we go straight to questions, members. Uh, take Elaine first this time, then Margaret. Um, we heard last week from the Lord Advocate that he was very supportive of the abolition of corroboration uh, on the basis, I think, of post cadre that uh, it was very difficult now to get corroboration of, uh, particularly rape cases, that even that intercourse had taken place, whether it was, it was forced or not. Um, what would your response be to... Uh, that concern that CADR has actually changed the landscape and we now need to think about uh, removing corroboration in order to protect rape victims. Now, just let me know if you want, if you indicate to me, I'll call you. Mark Harrower, please. Uh, thanks. Good morning, uh, convener. Thank you morning. for allowing me to uh, give evidence today. Um, I think the landscape has changed in that um, now that suspects have the right to have legal advice before uh, formal police questioning, they are more likely to uh, exercise their right to silence. Um, I can understand the, um, the concerns that there needs to be a rebalancing of the, 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 the evidential um, layout as a result of CADA, but my concern is that the removal of corroboration is not really the right place to be looking, and I think we're starting in the wrong place. Um, it is true to say that um, if fewer people confess, you will have corroboration in fewer cases, but you certainly, uh, from that source, but it uh, doesn't mean that um, you won't have corroboration from other sources. And whilst uh, CADR is an, uh, uh, a development in that line, as we've heard, DNA evidence is always improving, and in many more cases, we are able to get evidence from other sources which possibly in days gone by we couldn't get those those sources so um, do we need to remove corroboration because there will be fewer instances where penetration is corroborated um, I think that um, that would be a dangerous way to go at the moment if you look at the rate of conviction on, uh, by juries in cases of this type it is um, notoriously among the, the, the lowest rates of conviction of, of jury trials going ahead. And I think that it's too simple to say that um, juries are doing that because there isn't enough uh, supportive evidence. I think juries are, are hesitant to convict in all serious cases. And there are, there are many reasons why they acquit in, in, in rape cases, in cases of attempted rape. And um, I think we need to look at the, the whole picture here. I think the removal of corroboration across the board would be a massive step. It would be a massive step. It certainly would be, because it's recognised by Lord Carlow as being one of the pillars of our system at the moment. Something to get at these crimes which are committed in private. Um, I think we need to be a bit more imaginative if we want to assist the Crown in finding ways to, 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 to support complainers' evidence rather than removing corroboration across the board. I think yes, I... no, Mr. Wolf, come on automatically if you just indicate and I call you. Mr. Yes. Uh, Yes, thank you, convener, and, and I too am grateful to be here uh, giving evidence this, this uh, week on this subject, um, which is perhaps, perhaps the most significant proposal that this committee will have had to consider in terms of its systemic impact on the criminal justice system as a whole. Um, like Mark Harrower, um, I, I, I would respond in, in a number of ways to that observation um, or, or question. Uh, the first point is the one that he's made, that um, in, a, in circumstances where it may be, it may be that one is le less likely to have a, an admission at police interview, um, one answer is to uh, look harder for other sorts of evidence and in the sort of case we're talking about uh, DNA evidence is 
in many cases, in many cases, uh, a, 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 a realistic option. Uh, the second point is this: that the proposal to abolish corroboration is one which will affect every case across the whole criminal justice system. Uh, and um, as I suspect we all appreciate, at root it's a, 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 a rule which reflects the practical common sense that if there's evidence from more than one source, then one has uh, a degree of confidence and conviction that the case is, is uh, 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 well made. Uh, and at root, there is a serious policy question to be, be asked. Is that rule as a safeguard against miscarriages of justice, uh, uh, which um, uh, is fundamental to the operation of our criminal justice system, uh, one which uh, is a good rule and which we should hold on to? Or is the um, particular issue which has been identified in relation to uh, 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 the kind of case that um, uh, we're talking about here, is that uh, of such significance that one needs to, to uh, change the rule? Now, if one is going to change the rule, uh, then uh, there are a number of things that one has to look at. One is, are there, are there alternative approaches uh, uh, which are uh, short of uh, abolishing corroboration across the board. Should one, should one be looking uh, at, at um, uh, modifications of the way that corroboration operates uh, in particular types of cases? And in any event, uh, given the systemic and fundamental nature of corroboration at every stage of our system, one has to look very hard at what it is that one is putting in its place, and one has to ask uh, uh, whether one is getting the right balance of safeguards against miscarriage of justice uh, uh, on the one hand uh, against a, a, a reasonable system for prosecuting crime on the other. Uh, and that's why fundamentally, fundamentally uh, uh, the faculty would uh, support the recommendation which Lord Gill made to this committee uh, last week that uh, this issue is one which uh, ought to be uh, examined um, uh, in the round, uh, looking at the whole uh, criminal justice system. Uh, and um, it, indeed, that's been the position of the faculty from the outset, that, that, that this is an issue of such fundamental importance to our criminal justice system that if we're going to look at it, uh, uh, it, it needs to be... Um, given to a body like a Royal Commission or the Scottish Law Commission with the widest possible remit to consider the implications uh, uh, right across the system. Mr McMenamin, yes. I think it's important, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation on behalf of the Law Society of Scotland for uh, giving evidence today. Uh, but I think it's important to remember that cadre was nothing to do with corroboration. Cadre was to do with the rights of individuals in police stations, and what applied, what should apply in that particular set of circumstances. The Carloway Review opened up the issue of corroboration as to how it might fit in uh, to that bigger picture. And from the Law Society of Scotland's point of view, we welcome the greater debate, but we feel that there should be a debate, a debate about the whole thing and not simply focus on how one can get people convicted following CADA and how one might apply evidential rules in order that convictions uh, can occur. In fact, I would go so far as to say this, that if the motivation for this bill is to have people convicted in certain classes of cases, then that would be quite wrong and indeed quite shameful. I think there must be some degree of deliberation about where we're starting from in all of this and where uh, we wish to go. Because what we're in danger of here, if this bill passes into legislation in its present form, is having a system of justice in which the safeguards against wrongful conviction are minimal, so minimal as to be described as basic, and indeed, compared to other jurisdictions, primitive. And I think people 
commentators and lawyers from other jurisdictions will look at Scotland and wonder why we're going backwards in this area. And they'll look at Scotland and wonder if we've learned nothing at all from the Cather experience. The Law Society takes the view that we have a great opportunity just now to widen the debate, to look at corroboration, other safeguards as well that might apply, and how it fits into our system. And indeed, the Law Society has invited uh, a number of parties, both pro uh, and against retention of corroboration, uh, to a debate uh, in January of next year for that purpose. But for the, for the moment, uh, I think we have to look at the initial starting point, and that is CADA, the rights of individuals, and not how can we convict people. Mr White. Thank you, and again, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I've got, I think, four points to make, which to a large extent underline what has been said um, already. The first point is um, we started with the uh, Lord Advocate's observations, which are very powerful, because they are seeking to extrapolate from a very limited range of examples. Um, Rape is an appalling crime. Um, however, it's not clear to me that uh, one should, from the difficulties of convicting in such cases, extrapolate to every single criminal case there is. It's easy to forget, um, looking at much of the literature on this, that uh, over 90% of all cases, criminal cases, are summary cases. There's a very heavy emphasis on juries in much of the uh, um, debate. That's a very narrow range, very important. Quantity is not the only... Um, uh, dimension, but nevertheless it's a very tiny proportion of all cases, and of course sexual assaults and rapes are a very tiny proportion of those. I'm not of course suggesting they're unimportant. What I am pointing out is that uh, uh, the effects uh, would, uh, of abolishing corroboration would be felt enormously more widely than that. That was the first point. Second point, um, which again I think has been touched on, is, um, and others have referred to this um, in their uh, um, written evidence, um, there's never been an easier time to find corroboration because of the scientific and medical advances of the last few uh, decades. Um, so uh, it, um, in some senses it is a slightly strange time to be talking about um, um, abolishing the uh, requirement. That's the second point. The third point, um, slightly more fundamental perhaps, uh, explicitly or implicitly um, in much of the debate is this balance metaphor. And I have trouble with the balance metaphor um, because it assumes there are only two interests. It's a, a scale, a chemical balance is obviously the, the idea um, behind it. Um, it assumes there are only two interests to be weighed, whereas frequently there are more than two. It assumes that you've got some sort of unit of account. So you can say, I put more on that balance, therefore I must put some more, the same amount, on the other balance. There is no unit of account you can apply. It assumes that uh, you can tell when the balance is in balance, and a chemical balance, you may recall, there's a little indicator that shows you there is no indicator in this debate. Um, and uh, a fourth objection to um, that particular metaphor is uh, that, of course, what it leads to is um, uh, infinite debate, continuous debate, whereby one change is argued by people to require another change somewhere else, um, which requires a third person to say another change, and so on. Infinite continuation of debate, which is perhaps unfortunate. Um, and my fourth and final point is, uh, again, reiterating what others have said, this is a central issue. Corroboration, like cross-examination, is a means of testing the quality of evidence. Much of the debate has been about corroboration as quantity. Yes, there is clearly a quantitative aspect, but one shouldn't forget there's a qualitative aspect as well. It improves the case if there is um, compensation. Therefore, as others have said, this is hardly novel, really there is a need to look at it in the round. I notice that uh, the not proven verdict has been sent off to the Law Commission. Um, that's an interesting and quite important issue, but of enormously less importance, I suggest, than the question of corroboration. So um, why should corroboration not also be sent off to the Law Commission or some other body for a look at it and, if it were to be limited or um, abolished, any of the alternative safeguards? The Lord Advocates also argued that uh, the proposed prosecutorial test, which I presume is somehow something similar to exists in England, would act as a, a safeguard against uh, uh, the... It would be based on the reasonable prospect, a reasonable prospect of conviction. That would provide some sort of safeguard uh, against um, uh, a prosecution of cases which are, are based on very flimsy evidence. And I was quite interested in what Mr Menemann said, is that, you know, in terms of other jurisdictions, because we've also been 
told by those who support the proposal that very few uh, jurisdictions across the world actually use corroboration, and we are somehow behind the times because we've got it. Well, maybe I can address that particular point because I think a lot of people are under the misapprehension that corroboration doesn't exist in other jurisdictions. In fact, it does. Uh, the English have it. There's a provision in the Police and Criminal Evidence Act of 1984 for persons who have mental handicaps. If they give a confession to the police, that must be corroborated. So there's a safeguard built into the English system, which, again, if our bill passes through into legislation, we will not have. So vulnerable people will be better off in England by virtue of corroboration than they will in Scotland. The Dutch system uses corroboration for confession evidence as well. So I think a lot of people are wrong thinking that we are the only country who apply corroboration. I think it's true to say that we apply it on a more widespread basis and rely on it more than any other country. But other countries do apply. I'm using only those two jurisdictions. I know in the United States as well, uh, there's much use of corroboration. Indeed, uh, any research will show that other jurisdictions consider corroboration as something uh, which must be looked at in many cases. And of course, in England, you have safeguards built into the system whereby um, judges in certain cases caution juries regarding corroboration, regarding single source evidence uh, prosecutions. All of this is different to our system. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, it's just different. We have developed our system in a different way. We're now about to see that disappear. And we're now about to have a situation where, unlike many other countries, corroboration will simply not feature. Uh, and I agree with my colleagues here that is, it is the main safeguard is about to go if this bill goes through. And what we're left with is, as Mark Harrow has said, in solemn cases, the minimal that could be, minimum that could be done, increasing a jury by two votes. We also have uh, the not proven verdict, some would say. But of course, there's been no research done in that at all to show what impact it has as a safeguard. All we know is it's a verdict of acquittal. We can't look into the minds of juries. We're prevented from doing so. The point I'm making is this, that it's been said in this uh, committee recently by the Lord Justice General that this has not been thought through. Uh, I think that is absolutely the case. This needs to be thought through a lot more thoroughly than it has. We need to do more research into other jurisdictions. We need to do more research into what systems might apply here in Scotland. Whether we abandon corroboration entirely or retain it in part for certain cases, is a distinct possibility that that might work, but this has not been looked at. Simply to throw it out altogether, uh, we're in danger of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Mr Harrower said that there are reasons why juries, I mean, you said quite rightly what, how juries think and come to decisions is an unknown quantity, but you actually said, Mr Harrower, that you thought there were reasons why juries don't convict. Now, what's that based on and what is it? I think that <clears throat> certainly crimes committed in private and, and sexual crimes committed in private are very difficult cases for juries to assess. And I think that they um, are always... Juries do not go into court looking to acquit people. Juries go into court looking to do their job properly. And I think that the jury system is, is probably the fairest method of trying somebody that, 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 we, can, that we can use. Um, as a, as a defence lawyer who has, over the years, represented a number of people um, accused of rape, um, you see that... Um, Complaints of rape come out of very emotionally charged situations, situations where very often alcohol is present, very often the people know each other, and there may be some history between, between these people. Um, I think more than any other case, um, certainly rape allegations and similar allegations, allegations of that type are very difficult for juries to assess, because juries will see a witness only for a quite a short time in the witness box, and they'll see an accused only for a short time in the witness box as well, if the accused gives evidence. And um, when witnesses give evidence in courts, obviously it's a, it's a natural environment for that, for that person. They may be giving evidence over a TV screen, for example, because special measures are, are present. Um, the person may not 
perform well on the day because of the pressures of being in court. And that applies both to the accused and to, 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 the, to the complainer. And I think that um, although some reference has been made by certain of the contributors to, to this whole process that uh, we have certain preconceptions in Scotland which need to be tackled about the way that women dress uh, and, and the things that, that we know um, have certainly in the past been identified as problems. I think modern juries nowadays um, really um, are hesitant to convict in rape cases because, because even with corroboration, it very often boils down to one word against another. Even if you get the case into court with corroboration that there was penetration and the question comes down to whether there was consent or not, I think it's still a very difficult assessment for juries to make. And that assessment will become even more difficult if you're going to put cases into court where there is no corroboration. At the moment, um, as I think the Lord Advocate said, you need to have some support for the three essentials to prove rape. That's the penetration, the um, lack of consent, and the mens rea on the part of the accused. And the moment the cases are going into court have that element of additional evidence. What is proposed is that we put cases into court where that el additional element is absent. How do we expect juries to be more sure when that evidence isn't there? And talking about the qualitative test that uh, Mrs Murray mentioned, um, we need only look over the border to a very recent case where there was a very high profile prosecution for rape based on the sole evidence of a complainer. That resulted in a unanimous acquittal for the person accused. And what effect has that had on the system? Um, miscarriages of justice, and, that, and this depends on your definition of miscarriage of justice. I know that the Lord, uh, uh, Lord Carraway uh, says that people who are not uh, brought into court qualify for the same, um, the same definition. But when someone's acquitted in a high profile case like that, it's equally as damaging, I would say, for the criminal justice system if we are left wondering why that case ever got into court in the first place. And if, if, if you read the newspaper reports about the, the Lavelle case, the, co the commentators uh, saying, how on earth did we get that case into court in the first place? That case would never have made it to court in Scotland because of corroboration. And of course, the result is that uh, the accused's life is, uh, is ruined. He's got a lot of rebuilding to be done. And the, the uh, complainer, um, having found to have been uh, disbelieved, what is the effect on her going forward? She's going to have to deal with, with that as well. We need to make difficult decisions uh, in our justice system as to what cases we put into court. It's not simply a question of just putting witnesses in and letting them get on with it. And the rules that we have established over a very, very long time have served us extremely well, as Lord Gill said. We have very, very few miscarriages of justice in this, in this country. And the reason for that is because we have drawn a line at a very, at quite a high line and said that we will not put cases into court unless we can be sure that, that if a conviction is returned, we've got the right person. Uh, I'll take Margaret, then I've got John Finney, Roderick, Sandra, Alison and John. And it's all on corroboration, so there's no such thing as really a supplementary. So it's all about corroboration, I take it. Okay. And then, are you wanting it as well, Christian? Yeah. Right, Margaret. Good morning. Um, I wonder, you've had quite a lot of evidence uh, this morning, if we could just make quite clear um, three things. First of all, does the, the panel agree that um, the fact other jurisdictions do or do not have corroboration. There's not reason in itself to abolish it. Secondly, the Carloway um, report looked at two options, abolish, retain. The third option, which um, seems to be a viable one, was not looked at, retention and improving the law of evidence in order to make um, abolition, uh, in order to make corroboration easier. Uh, would the, the panel fa favour looking at that? And um, I'm thinking particularly of the Law Society's debate coming up where we're looking at retention and abolition and maybe not the third way, maybe if that would be a useful one to add. And um, thirdly, for the avoidance of doubt, two of the panellists have indicated this would be good. Lord Gill suggested, because we are very worried in this committee about the pressure of work, the fact that we're looking at a very lengthy bill in the Criminal Justice um, Scotland Bill with lots of provisions where corroboration is slotted in. And given the importance of it to the criminal justice system and Scots law, and also um, the weight of opinion against abolition, would the panel favour taking the provisions out of the bill and giving it to something like a Royal Commission to properly look at this issue. These are the three um, things that I would like your opinion on. Mr McMenamin. On that last point, yes. Uh, the Law Society of Scotland would favour these uh, matters coming out of the bill 
and going before preferably our Royal Commission. We think it's so important that we need the wider debate, we need wider research, as I've already mentioned, and yes, I would agree entirely with that suggestion. And the options? Well, at the present time, I think it would be premature, uh, having said what I've said about we need wider research and discussion, to say that one thing should uh, happen over another, but at the moment, corroboration should not go because we do not have anything in its place to provide the safeguard that it provides at the present time. We could ask you to look at it another way, um, retaining it but improving the law of evidence to make um, corroboration easier. As Mr White already said, with new technology and with more DNA, um, we should be able to, to use that um, to, to try well, and Well, I think we already do, because yeah. corroboration in various aspects has been... Uh, whittled down, for want of a better expression, to the bare minimum. Um, I'll give you an example. In cases uh, where there is scientific evidence, uh, there is actually now statutory provision, there has been for some time, for only one scientist to be called to give evidence for the Crown, and notice is given by the Crown in the service of an indictment that that is to happen, and therefore you need only one person to speak to scientific evidence in those circumstances. Lord Carloway, uh, whom I've heard speak on uh, this on a number of occasions, uh, has stated that, in his view, corroboration has been reduced in various areas to almost nothing, which is one of the reasons why he advances his argument for its abolition. And I think that is correct. Um, in our uh, evidential rules, it does not take much at all to corroborate a confession. We could have special knowledge confessions, which basically means that if somebody makes some reference in a confession, which indicates they may have been the perpetrator, they may have had some knowledge of how a crime was committed, that's enough. So we I already think... have a weakened, very much weakened uh, rule regarding corroboration in many aspects in which we apply it. I think we're looking at this in different ways. I'm looking to strengthen how corroboration could be uh, improved um, and found <coughs> to, to be more easily established, not just on, on DNA new te technology, but what's actually happening in the court just now, the Moore of Doctrine, the time scales which are applied in practice that could be really, uh, relaxed a little bit to improve condition. These are just two that we are mm -hmm. bringing today in the panel, which I think rather proves the point that there is um, an argument for a third way, which is at least looking at retention while at the same time improving the law. Um, I don't can think I, either of us... Know, can I just caution you about using the word we? I mean, there may be some who don't... I have no oh, well, problem we. with what you say, but you just have to speak for Whoever. yourself, and as does everyone else. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, okay. Yes. So okay. Um, it's, it's something to consider. And the third one, the fact that um, what other jurisdictions do, I think that was a, pay, a point Lord Gale made at the very beginning of his submission last week, you know, what they do is or is not a reason in itself to, to retain or abolish corroboration. Well, I've had the answer from Mr McMenamin, but mm -hmm. do the others concur? Do you concur yeah. as well, Mr Wolfe? Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Convener. Um, I, I agree with all three propositions uh, that have been put to me, and perhaps on the last point, the comparison with other jurisdictions, um, uh, in, in, I'd suggest it's a mistake to look narrowly at the question of, what, of corroboration and what other systems have in relation to the rule of corroboration. You have to look at a system in the round, and um, a much more better informed uh, uh, authority than myself, the Regis Professor from Glasgow and his colleagues have put in written, written evidence to this committee to the effect that if the Criminal Justice Scotland Bill as it now stands were to be enacted, it would reduce the level of protection against wrongful conviction offered in Scotland below that offered in any comparable jurisdiction. And uh, 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 that's uh, a statement by three, three uh, uh, distinguished academics from Glasgow University, which uh, I, I'd suggest has to be taken seriously. Uh, the other point that perhaps is worth making in relation to the contrast between Scotland and other jurisdictions is that in Scotland, uh, over the years, uh, a variety of matters which in other jurisdictions form part of their suite of safeguards um, have been looked at and rejected uh, 
among other reasons, on the basis that we have the protection of corroboration. And I can give the example of uh, dock identification, the picking out in the court of the uh, accused by a witness. Many systems regard this as uh, uh, an unfair procedure. In our law, within limits, it's regarded <coughs> as acceptable. And one of the reasons it's been found to be acceptable in our system is because we have corroboration. And it, 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 it follows that if we are to abolish corroboration, get rid of corroboration across the board, uh, we have to look, we have to look again at a variety of the rules that we uh, apply routinely in our courts um, and look again as to whether those remain uh, an acceptable part of a modern criminal justice system which ha doesn't have corroboration. So uh, it's very important, I would suggest, to um, uh, 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 not look at the issue of corroboration in isolation. And, and these are, these, these are uh, among the reasons why, if the matter is to be looked at, and, and the faculty doesn't suggest that there isn't, a, that there isn't an issue to be examined, and we welcome the debate on the issue. Um, it, it's a serious and important one. Um, but but uh, if it's to be examined, it should be done looking at all the structures and rules of our criminal justice system in the round. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes, can I take someone else now for a minute? I've got such a list. We could all come back. I beg your pardon, Mr. I'm just going to add, if I might, just to meet the point perhaps quite directly. Uh, if it were a unique system, then that would look like a very good reason for abolition, I think. You know, they're all out of step except our Johnny. Um, however, I think uh, the um, objection very commonly is not that that is not an argument, but it's a burden of proof issue. That's to say it's an argument, but no more than an argument, or if you like, it's not a knockdown argument, hence the suggestions that the matter needs to be looked at more fully. Thank you. Uh, Bert, I, did, you, did you want to, you want to come in? Yes, yes, I can. I, I think the, the proposal to abolish cooperation should be taken out of the bill, and um, I don't think I've spoken to a single solicitor, certainly in, in my jurisdiction, who uh, uh, supports the removal of it. And you might think that uh, my uh, profession were the, 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 was a profession most likely to benefit from more cases going into court, but we don't want to see that because um, every solicitor who's been doing this job for a particularly long period of time who's been running trials week in, week out, will be able to tell you about a handful of cases, and hopefully it's only a handful of cases, where he or she genuinely believes that there's, genuinely believes there's been a miscarriage of justice. Now, most of these miscarriages of justice are below the radar because they happen at summary level. And as we've already heard, the vast majority of prosecutions in Scotland are at summary level. In fact, in 2011-2012, 96% of all con people convicted were convicted in the Sheriff's Summary Courts and the GP Court, and, of course, the safeguard... Uh, the so-called safeguard of improving the, the, or raising the, the jury voting will have absolutely won't even touch that uh, because juries never go anywhere near the share of summary courts or GP courts. The vast majority of convictions in this country have nothing to do with jury voting, and that's one of our main concerns. That there's nothing proposed in this bill as an additional safeguard in summary business at all. But quite apart from that, um, we, we, most solicitors um, will be able to tell you that they have dealt with a number of cases over the years where people were convicted. And most decisions on guilt are based on questions of credibility and reliability. That means who did the judge or jury believe and who did they reject. And when a judge or jury comes to a decision which is against your client, then there's really not much you can do about that. That's the end of the line. You only get one shot at a trial in Scotland and you only get really one appeal. And appeals uh, against conviction have to be based generally on errors in law. Um, you can't ask the, the appeal court to revisit all the evidence again and come to the different decision about who the uh, sheriff or, or jury believed. So it's a one-stop shop, and that's why I think we've been so um, determined uh, in Scotland to make sure that we get it right first time round. And that's why, because the formula we've arrived at has produced very few miscarriages of justice. And again, looking just to England, in the last couple of decades, there have been a number of very high-profile miscarriages of justice uh, overturned in the appeal court many of them based on single sources of evidence, primarily confession evidence, whereas in Scotland we always look for an independent check. So we've avoided what's happened down there uh, by virtue of the formula we have arrived at over a very long period of time. To suddenly change it, to take one um, of, the, of the, the parts of that equation away without really looking at what we need to replace it with, I think, is a, is a big mistake. 
As far as evolution of the law of evidence is concerned, I think it would be possible to look further at what we could do, and in particular cases, to assist uh, the Crown to get cases into court. But I think it's, it's something we look at, need to look at very, very carefully, because I think that you will need to water down the law of corroboration in respect of crimes committed in private if you're going to get more of these cases that Lord Advocate talked about into court. And is that, is, that, is that what we really want to do? Do we want to create a special class of case to get these cases into court so that juries make a decision in, ca very, in, in cases where there's going to be one against one? We could look at what the options are. Um, uh, the law of corroboration has managed to evolve over the, over the years. And as, uh, I mean, in recent times, we've managed to um, bring home two convictions for murder in cases where there was no body recovered. Now, that's in a system where we have all the challenges that corroboration puts forward in front of the Crown. And I think we can say that our justice system actually serves this country very well in respect of difficult cases like that. Um, so I, I think I, I agree with everyone else. We can't just um, rush to judgment in this. Uh, I think we need to look at the whole system because all the elements are interdependent. The number of times I've heard a sheriff say that he has found proof beyond reasonable doubt in the fact that there is corroboration. I've heard that many, many times, because sheriffs, of course, will give you reasons for their decisions in a conviction case. Juries can't. And I think we maybe need to look close, more closely at how juries arrive at their decisions as well, before we can safely say that 10 out of 12 is a safe margin. I have to say I've raised the issue about how juries arrive at decisions, but I mean, I'll just put this to you, because it, it, we put you, you're pleading on behalf of, uh, you're a defence lawyer, so you yes. would say that, wouldn't you? Because mm -hmm. some would say if you get rid of corroboration, uh, fewer of your clients will get off. How would you answer that? I would say that um, defence lawyers, um, many solicitors will start off on my side of the fence and will they'll quickly become prosecutors and, uh, and, and go to other parts of the system. We're all, we all have an interest in this system working properly. And as I've mentioned earlier, we all can think of cases which we don't really forget. We, are, we know there's been miscarriage of justice in our, uh, deep down. I can think of one rape conviction um, returned against a man in his early 20s a few years ago, and uh, he had no previous convictions, and it was a case where, uh, after a night's drinking, he met uh, a young woman in the town, and they, um, they got together, and there was evidence on video of, of, um, of them being together, and later on, intercourse happened in a, in, in a public place, and uh, according to the complainer, it was non-consensual, according to him, it was consensual. Now, without going into all the details of that case, I remain convinced to this day that that young man was innocent, and you'll never convince me otherwise. He was very well represented by someone who was a defence solicitor. He's now one of the top prosecutors in Scotland, and you won't convince him otherwise either. But because it was a, a decision based purely on credibility and reliability, there's nothing you can do. And I had to sit and tell him and his mother that because it, uh, our law is that all questions of credibility and reliability are exclusively for the jury or the judge, his case was at the end of the line. Now, I do not want to see an increase in cases like that, and that's the reason I'm opposed, and all my colleagues are opposed to the abolition of corroboration, because we believe, as does Lord Gill, that there will be an increase in miscarriage of justice. It stands to reason, if you lower the standards required, then you will convict more innocent people. Mr Wolf. As uh, professional lawyers, we are interested fundamentally in the proper administration of justice, both the securing of convictions against the guilty, but also the acquittal of those who are not guilty. Um, the Faculty of Advocates, um, in looking into this uh, matter, convened a committee which uh, uh, included uh, advocates with considerable prosecution experience as senior advocate deputies, as well as uh, experience from the defence side. And, um, uh, uh, I think it's important that the committee uh, understands that that's the, uh, the body that has put together the faculty's uh, uh, response. Um, uh, and fundamentally, uh, the, 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 the concern with, that the faculty has with this bill is that if the provision in relation to corroboration is enacted with the I suppose the ancillary provision relate, which increases the jury majority from uh, eight uh, to ten, we, are, we would be left with a system which uh, uh, fundamentally runs uh, an unacceptable risk of an unfair trial uh, in, in Scotland. 
I thought it was important to get on the record, because I know that's one of the issues that will be raised that you're speaking for um, from the defence side alone, and, I, and that gives an opportunity for that to be uh, challenged elsewhere. John Finney, followed by Roderick, please. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, morning, panel. Uh, I have a, a question about a phrase that keeps cropping up in our, uh, our evidence, and it's the phrase, access to justice, and the argument being put that uh, you know, the law or the requirement for corroboration is denying people access to justice. I wonder, appreciate your comments on that, along with issues around sufficiency of evidence and what the rationale for prosecution is, you know, the relationship with the public interest. Well, prosecution should always be in the public interest. That must be the starting point. It is an issue with our system of corroboration that certain persons who make complaints and if there is no corroboration, no back of evidence, they will not be in a position to give evidence because a prosecutor will decide that the case cannot go into court because of lack of corroboration. That is an issue and may well be something that has to be looked at. But in considering that, we have to have a system which is robust and a system that's fair to all, that is to witnesses and accused persons. And it's a difficult thing to reconcile, but um, at the present time, uh, the Law Society, which I, I hasten to mention, our members uh, consist of both defence lawyers, prosecutors, <coughs> and those who represent the interests of uh, people who have been the victims of crime. Um, we feel that there is now a great opportunity to look at all this and to come up with a system which will serve as well in the future. But it is a, a difficult issue, and I accept that totally, in the, our corroborative system, that there are some people who make complaints who will not have the chance to give evidence. Mr. Gould, just for one, just Kate, you wish yes. to, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, per perhaps it, one needs to look at it in, in this way. Um, uh, one ought to be concerned about access to effective justice. Um, the, you don't serve anyone's interests if you bring a prosecution which does not have reasonable prospects of success. It's not in the interests of a complainer to be put through a trial uh, 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 it, only for the jury uh, to acquit. And to put an accused through a trial if there are not uh, reasonable prospects of conviction is not only a waste of public resources, uh, 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 but it's deeply unfair to, 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 to that accused. So um, uh, 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 if one's going to talk about it, prosecution in the context of access, access to justice, it's important that we're talking about access to effective justice uh, and not simply um, uh, uh, the airing of an allegation uh, in the abstract. Yes, um, Mr. White. Thank you. Um, We're going to take Mr. White first this time, Mr. Howard. Mr. Okay, White. thank you very much. Um, uh, given the remarks about uh, defence lawyers would say that, wouldn't they? Um, can I say I, of course, have the advantage of being disinterested in this matter, um, being neither a prosecution nor a defence lawyer, but a rather... The word disinterested, which is one of my bumpiers. Well, years. I'm glad that that will appear yes. in the official report. Thank you. I love it. Oh, yes. Pleased to have given you I'm, pleasure. I'm not, I'm not saying you didn't know what you're saying, but so many use it the wrong way. And I, like, Miss Campbell we, taught we me how to use it. We must keep standards up. Uh, so, I, as a minor member of the judiciary, I do speak with that degree of disinterestedness. On the question of access to justice, uh, I take it this is, um, in effect, a reference to victims. Um, I'm concerned um, at uh, some aspects of the view taken of victims in the criminal justice system. Victims and witnesses tend to get um, collapsed into one group. Now, there are clearly very important issues about witnesses who are not infrequently victims, and clearly the criminal justice system has in the past been very remiss in treating them simply as prosecution fodder or defence fodder, as the case might be. Um, but I think we have to distinguish the interests of victims as victims from the interests of witnesses who may be victims. Um, and the insignificance of that is that I think there is danger in losing touch with 
what I think it would be uncontroversial to say is the underlying purpose of the entire criminal justice system, insofar as it's a system, or criminal law and criminal procedure. I mean, criminal law is that part of the law which um, identifies behaviours which are to be, I'll use the word punished, sanctions are to be applied. Criminal procedure is uh, the means by which rules for identifying those people are, um, uh, are, are laid down. Uh, so the underlying purpose of the criminal law is to identify those who have done a category of wrong which we will punish. Um, there is another part of the law entirely concerned with compensation of victims of one sort or another, the law of delict. Now, there's masses wrong with the law of delict, just as there's masses wrong with the criminal law. But I think that one has to, we have to be um, very careful of not trespassing out of the criminal um, justice system into the delictual system and assuming that the function of the criminal law is to provide a remedy for victims. If it does that, all well and good, but I hope it's not un uncontroversial to say that is not its fundamental function. And if we're going to try and change its fundamental function, we should know we're trying to do it and not do it by a sidewind. That was one point. The uh, second point on sufficiency and public interest, um, the uh, issue of the um, prosecutor's test for prosecution has been mentioned already, um, and I think we're coming back to it. Um, um, in, I, I think I'm correct in saying, um, well, certainly I'm correct in saying, in the Carloway report itself, uh, there was no discussion of what that test might be if corroboration were removed. There is, I see in the written evidence from Crown Office, um, what they think it should be, but I think it is accurate to say there has been very little discussion of that. What they write may be very sensible, but it's not something on which there has been um, a general debate. Um, so if there is to, if the prosecution decision uh, or the nature of the prosecution decision is to change, as it must, then there would have to be considerable debate as to what that test would be. Thank you. And Mr. Harrow now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we have to remember that our system, like all systems of justice, is a human system and it's never going to be perfect. We can never convict everyone who's guilty and we can never protect everyone who's innocent um, every day of the week. All we can try and do is achieve a balance um, whereby we properly and fairly um, process as many guilty people as possible whilst keeping miscarriage of justice to a minimum. And I think that that is a point. That, that is something we have managed to achieve. Um, the phrase access to justice uh, implies opening up the courts to those um, who um, have a, a, com a, a complaint and who um, want to um, see the, uh, the person that they perceive to be have, have wronged against them um, come to justice. They want to see them convicted. They want to see them punished. We have to remember that not everybody who makes a complaint is telling the truth. Unfortunately, because it's a human system, um, whilst many people come to court to do their best and tell the truth, um, a number of people come to court in order to lie. And it's so difficult for a human system, especially dealing with witnesses in a short space of time, to to, to, to ascertain who is telling the truth and who is lying. And we recognise that asking juries to make these decisions is a very difficult thing to do. And what we've done in Scotland is we've given them some assistance in that saying, look for something else, an independent check, not just juries, but sheriffs as well. And it's worked very well for us. And by um, lowering the standard of proof, you will open the doors of the court to more complainers, and you will also increase the risk of convicting more people on lesser evidence, which will increase the risk of miscarriage of justice. Um, thank you for that. With regard to... Just a little bit. Yes. So that's Sorry. it. Thank you. Um, with regard to the crime of rape and the three elements that um, you referred to, of no consent, mens rea, and uh, the proof of, of penetration, this was alluded to last week by the Lord Advocate, who said that post CADA, um, before CADA, you had a situation where an accused may have previously admitted uh, to consensual um, intercourse and that one of the elements had then been proved. If, if one of the catalysts for this removal is to improve the conviction rate for the heinous crimes, that, 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 including rape, um, do you think there will be an alteration to the three elements or um, are there other consequential effects of that? 
because it would seem if you don't prove penetration, then you are talking about another heinous crime, potentially. I think that um, at the moment, I go back to what I said earlier, at the moment when we do have corroboration, juries are finding it difficult to arrive at who they, who, who they think is telling the truth in situations like this. Um, I don't know how else you're going to be able to corroborate the act of penetration other than by an admission on the part of the accused or forensic evidence. It's just not going to happen. And then the only way to deal with that, I think, unless you can find some compelling supporting evidence, and there were some examples given in the, the supplementary Crown submission, which I think are powerful arguments when you look at them, but they don't amount to corroboration as we understand, uh, presently know it. But I think that you either have corroboration or you don't. And if you get rid of corroboration, then it will be possible to convict someone of rape um, who, is, who, um, who has never met that, that, that person. And I know, I know the Crown intend to apply a qualitative test and look for supporting evidence, but I don't hear them saying we definitely will not prosecute uh, when there is no supporting evidence. And uh, you just need to look again down south to that case where there was no supporting evidence and it was prosecuted all the way. And that is a situation I think we should seek to avoid in Scotland. However difficult that these choices may be, and however difficult it may be to tell someone who you think may make a very good witness, I'm sorry that this is a rule, but I think we need to have these rules to ensure that that the balance we have struck here remains. I beg, sorry, I was uh, just going to see if it, uh, you've, have you concluded? I've, no, I have one final question, if I may, please, convener. Mm -hmm. and, and that relates to something uh, uh, I think that Mr Harrower alluded to, and that was that there had been two recent convictions for murder where no body uh, had been found, and that showed that, that with corroboration and sufficient investigation that uh, conviction could be obtained. That would require the direction of Crown to the police service often and dedicated police resources available. Do you think our system as configured has a sufficiency of resources in the Crown to ensure that would happen in every case? Mr Wolf. Yes. Um, <laughs> although we, 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 in this committee we're talking about, as it were, fundamental principles, one can't ignore the question of resources. And um, uh, 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 the faculty has put in uh, a response to the Finance Committee on the financial memorandum to this uh, bill. Uh, on the Crown's own analysis, um, uh, they, they predict an increase in the number of solemn prosecutions if corroboration is abolished of between 3.5% and 12.5%. Now that's 220 to 760 additional cases prosecuted on indictment uh, a, a year and a much greater number of additional summary prosecutions. Uh, there are various assumptions built into the approach they've taken to resources and, and we, we seek to address that in our comments in, in writing. But the bottom line is that significant additional costs as a result of the measure are identified as being required at all stages of the criminal justice system, particularly in Crown Office and in the courts. But for the courts, the estimate is uh, £3.25 million in staff resources and about 900000 in training. And one thing that is striking about the financial memorandum is that it states that those additional costs to the Crown and the uh, court system will be absorbed uh, without any real increase uh, in funding. Now, of course, if this is the right thing to do, then one has to uh, find ways of, of resourcing it. But if one's looking at a systemic change of this sort, one does have, uh, I would suggest, to look uh, in a clear-eyed way at what the practical consequences will be uh, for the system. And um, uh, 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 there has to be a concern that um, uh, cases will, well, first of all, that the, 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 a system that's already um, it, it may be regarded as stretched, uh, it, it becomes overstretched. Uh, and secondly, there has to be a concern that, the that in a situation where the investigation doesn't have to be done, then it may not be done. 
uh, and I say that without suggesting any want of integrity on the part of the police or, 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 or prosecutors. I want to, if I may Thank move you. on, I've got Roderick, then Sandra, then Alison, John and Christian. Um, morning, panel. Uh, Kavina, can I refer to my register of interest as a member of the Faculty of Advocates? Uh, I'd like to begin, if I may, by just referring to uh, uh, the Crown submission and the new test for prosecution, um, which, is, which requires a prosecutor to make assessments both uh, 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 as the public interest, which is no change from the present. But the first part of the test, the evidential test, is to be made up of three elements. A quantitative assessment, is there sufficient evidence of the essential facts that a crime took place and the accused was the perpetrator? Uh, B, a qualitative assessment, is the available evidence admissible, credible and reliable? And C, on the basis of the evidence, is there a reasonable prospect of conviction in that it is more likely than not that the court would find the case proved beyond reasonable doubt? Um, I wanted your more specific views on how far you thought this new test would provide safeguards against uh, kind of uh, prosecutions going forward and obviously potential miscarriages of justice. How much of an improvement do you think this test would be? Who wants to? Any safeguards? I mean, it is largely speculative on the part of a prosecutor. These are assessments which a professional prosecutor must make based on his or her experience. But within it, there are no real safeguards. Uh, and especially, following upon the, the last point which was answered, at the present time, there is widespread concern and a widespread perception within the legal profession that the Crown are struggling with the workload that they have at the present time. It's not something perhaps the Lord Advocate would readily accept or admit to, but uh, I can speak as uh, somebody who is still a practicing defence lawyer that uh, there is that view of the Crown at the present time. And to think of uh, beleaguered Procurator's fiscal, marking cases in Crown Council, uh, perhaps less so, but if you have a, a, Crown, a prosecution system which is under stress, then I think your chances of having prosecutors marking cases and then thinking about safeguards are diminishing all the time. Mr Wolf. Yes. Um, I don't for a moment uh, doubt the, uh, as I said a moment ago, the integrity with which prosecutors will seek to apply this test. But there is a constitutional point, which is that we're looking at the statutory here as, as uh, in this parliament as, as uh, 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 looking at legislation, the statutory safeguards uh, uh, and structures within which a trial will uh, take place. Um, the Lord Advocate's guidance to prosecutors uh, is uh, uh, not to be enshrined in statute uh, and, as Mr White said, has been the subject of, as yet, relatively little debate. Now, Lord Advocates may come and go, they may change their guidance. Um, uh, and um, just to pick up one point in the uh, statement that's been uh, uh, provided, uh, one can notice that the Lord Advocate acknowledges that for certain classes of individuals, um, those uh, identified in paragraph 33, um, proceedings uh, 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 would be not be taken up without strong supporting evidence. Now, I think one understands why the Lord Advocate says that in, in those particular cases, but there's an example of how um, uh, the guidance that's to be provided is going to result in um, the test being applied in different ways to different classes of case uh, in ways that, um, and I'm not being critical of the Crown's um, written evidence here, in ways which uh, as yet are unclear and, uh, and unknown. So it's part of, a, 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 as, as legislators, um, a, 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 as one's looking at a, a proposed bill and asking, are we putting in place a system that adequately secures the conviction of the guilty, but the acquittal of the innocent? Um, are, are we structurally putting in place a system that uh, provides uh, adequate assurance? Um, and of course, the role of the prosecutor is, is, is an important one, but um, it, it's not a legislative safeguard. And precisely how this, uh, uh, the test will be applied uh, uh, remains to be seen. 
Mm. Else wish to comment? Yeah, can I say that uh, on the ground in, in the courts, we, uh, the, the bar, are seeing prosecutors who are under increasing pressure. They have um, big workloads nowadays, and there also seems to be uh, categories of case which they are on instruction to proceed to trial come what may, which rather um, counts away from the, the tradition we've always had where, whereby prosecutors have had a discretion uh, to discontinue cases if they don't believe that they're in the public interest. There are certain aspects of cases, and I've, I've spoken to prosecutors about this, where um, such as uh, cases which have been highlighted as being of particular concern to society in recent times, such as cases with racial aggravations, religious aggravations. Um, more recently, recently as last week, I think there was a, a stalking case which was highlighted in the Daily Record. And uh, Crown Office, according to the Daily Record, made a statement that um, in, in such circumstances, um, pleas of not guilty would not be accepted without evidence being heard at trial. So stalking cases under Section 39 okay. now seem to fall under the category of cases which have to go to trial. And I spoke to a prosecutor as recently as this morning, just to uh, make sure what I'm about to say is right. And it, 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 there are certain categories of cases where a certain sensitivity is identified, whereby it is thought that these cases should uh, proceed to evidence in almost all cases of its type. So there are certain cases which are prioritised for trial. Now, um, the, the new test which is proposed will um, require of prosecutors um, a great deal of, um, I think, independent assessment of the evidence and a taking on a responsibility in respect of these cases um, because they will need to assess uh, what supportive evidence there is and what the, what the quality of that supporting evidence is and whether it's enough to justify the case going into court. They are expected to make a decision about whether that case could reasonably proceed to, to a conviction on the basis of what will often be written statements. I don't think it's proposed that in every single case, and there were an awful lot of uh, people prosecuted um, year on year, uh, I think 124,736 people were prosecuted, proceeded against in court in 2011-2012, if corroboration doesn't apply to all of these cases, then how is that assessment to be made? We don't expect them to get the complainers in in every single case. So they'll need to do, make that assessment based on written statements. And these written statements will be very often in the smaller cases, the summary cases which I've mentioned, where you can still get up to 18 months in jail if you're convicted. Um, these, these statements will be taken by police officers, sometimes not very experienced police officers, late at night when they're under pressure, in the middle of George Street when there's a big ramy going on. And uh, how are prosecutors to make a proper assessment of whether that case has a reasonable prospect of conviction based on statements alone, especially when they may be subject to additional um, influences, which are that they have to be careful of cases with particular sensitivity. So I, I worry how that test will actually apply and how our prosecutors who are so used to corroboration at the moment, how they're going to change their mindset to apply this new test properly. Are you saying, sorry, are you saying from, you're being a bit delicate about this, but are you saying, given the example of the stalking case, that you're implying that cases of sexual assault, rape, domestic violence, because of the sense, will be taken to court no matter what? I mean, or almost no matter what. Is that where you were going with that? I think that there are categories of case that we see going into court that the prosecutors are clearly under instruction to get on with it. Uh, for example, just a couple of weeks ago, I saw a domestic abuse case um, sitting, a file sitting in court on the table with a big note from a senior prosecutor to the junior prosecutor saying, there's a reluctant complainer in this case, but proceed anyway. Now, you could say it's in the public interest to proceed with all domestic yes. abuse cases because yes. it's an, a, it is an area of concern, quite rightly so. But I think if we apply that to every single case of a particular type, we will clog up the courts with cases which have to proceed to a conclusion um, and, and, for example, last week I had a jury trial in the sitting in Edinburgh, which was one of nine jury trials that jumped out of that sitting last week. And my, that was, that, I think that was the third or fourth trial diet that that case of mine had got to. We have to be able to balance, as Mr Wolfe says, the, the, the resources which are not finite in this country with prioritising cases which truly are the most important cases. And we need to be very guarded against um, imposing uh, blanket directions in cases of, of, of a particular type because we're worried about um, what the daily record might say.
Roderick. Could, could I move on to another subject, the reasonable jury um, uh, point, which was in the Scottish Government's uh, second consultation on safeguards, which is not preceded within the bill. Um, I just wonder what the panel's view was uh, on this point. Lord Carloway, I think, suggested that um, there were two reasons why he thought it was inappropriate, one of which was that uh, if, uh, if the judge got it wrong, it would be very late in the day for the prosecutor uh, to, to try and appeal this, and that would be costly in terms of resources. And secondly, I think he thought that it would be an op opportunity for an idiosyncratic judge if one judge alone made this decision, where if it's restricted to the appeal court, three judges, they're more likely to get it right. Um, any thoughts on that and then it's Mr. Will. implication? Yes. Um, the, 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 uh, as I understand it, Mr. Campbell's um, raising the question of whether the trial judge should, should have the right to withdraw a case from the jury on the basis that the evidence uh, uh, doesn't meet whatever the uh, appropriate standard is. Um, and the, the, the first point uh, uh, to make is that we have a ground of appeal in our system. Uh, uh, the appeal court can set aside a conviction on the basis that no reasonable jury would have convicted. Now, logically, that implies that we recognise that on occasion, juries are, do, do bring in verdicts which are, are unreasonable. And it does seem uh, odd uh, that we are not allowing the one independent and impartial judge, highly trained, who has actually seen the evidence, that we're depriving him or her of the power to uh, withdraw a case from the jury in those circumstances. Um, it does tie in with the point about prosecutorial discretion, because let's say we have a prosecu prosecution brought in good faith on the basis that it's thought the evidence meets the test, but that at trial, when the witnesses actually appear, the evidence doesn't meet that test. Now, one would hope the prosecutor in those circumstances would withdraw the case from the jury, but uh, the prosecutor may not. Are we to say that the judge may not say, I don't take the view that the evidence meets a test which would have allowed this case to be prosecuted in the first place, and I'm going to take it away from the jury. So uh, it, 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 it's, it, uh, I would suggest odd that that's uh, a, a proposal that's not been taken forward. To meet immediately the objection that... Um, uh, it puts power into the hands of a trial judge who may exercise it idiosyncratically. Uh, this parliament has recently provided for a right of appeal where a trial judge upholds a no case to answer submission. And uh, we've had experience of such appeals and appeal courts are convened very swiftly, um, effectively overnight, so that the appeal court can review the trial judge's decision to um, uphold the no case to answer submission and remove the case from the jury by that means. Uh, and uh, it, it, the reason that the appeal court is convened swiftly is so that if the appeal is the crown appeal is upheld, it can go straight back to the jury and the jury can decide it. So this parliament's already put in place the mechanism which can deal with uh, the concern that Lord Carloway. Uh, express. There's no reason why a similar Crown appeal couldn't be made available against a decision of this sort. Mr White. Uh, thank you. Um, I just want to emphasise again um, a point about the uh, um, propensity of trials to be summary. Um, if further safeguards of this sort of nature has been mentioned um, are to be introduced, the discussion has been entirely, I think, concerning jury trials, which, as we know, is a tiny proportion. It's difficult to imagine um, that this particular form of how this particular form of safeguard um, could be operated in summary trials because the, uh, the fact finder um, and the law decider are collapsed into one. Um, so a summary sheriff or um, JP would presumably have to advise himself on the matter. Could I just yes, move on briefly? The, the, the question of uh, the numbers uh, of uh, jurors, um, 10 or 12, put it that way. Um, the judges collectively seem to be happy enough with two-thirds, whereas I see from the faculty from your written evidence um, that, in your view, would still mean that potentially five people have taken a different view, and that's not a safe way um, uh, to preserve or prevent miscarriages of justice. Uh, any further comments on that, or is it just a difference between you and the judges? Well, if you have a third of a jury who have a reasonable doubt, doesn't that raise alarm bells over the conviction? Mm. 
even more so than the situation we have now, where it's, you only need to eight out of uh, 15 to convict. Um, I appreciate the senior judiciary have expressed that that may be an appropriate number, 10 out of 15, but where does that come from? I mean, there's, again, there's been no research done on it. We've not looked at, uh, in detail at other jurisdictions. Look at England, for example. I mean, if we're going to take England, as a temp England and Wales, I should say, as a template for uh, a system which doesn't use corroboration in a widespread fashion, then their juries are, I think, in the first instance, directed to return unanimous verdicts and only on direction by the judge, 10 out of 12 for a conviction. Now, that's substantially higher. And in fact, um, I understand, and again, making reference to uh, the studies um, done by academics, James Wolfe referred to uh, earlier on, that the only other system which applies a single, a straightforward majority is the Russian system. Now, I'm not decrying the Russian system at all in any way, but I understand even then their system is different. They don't rely on a single verdict returned. There's more of a questionnaire uh, applied to the jury. And, in, of course, in other jurisdictions, we know that juries sit sometimes with uh, qualified lawyers or persons who, who may advise them. So, going back to what I said at the very early stage uh, in my evidence today, simply by increasing the number required for conviction by two, with no background to that, no research, the Law Society of Scotland are deeply unhappy with that. I agree. Can I, I say that um, I, I agree uh, that, that there has been insufficient research uh, done on how juries reach their verdicts? And to give you an example of uh, a jury trial I conducted a couple of years ago, a case of a nurse who was accused of assaulting uh, an elderly uh, patient, um, the nurse was acquitted unanimously, and um, rightly so, I feel. And when I went into the the jury room to help bar officer clear out all the productions after the case because we had uh, very voluminous um, defence productions when they went to, to, to get out. We found a piece of paper lying on the table and uh, it had 12 not guilty, 2 not proven, 1 don't know. Now, we would never have known how that jury arrived, if that was how they in, fa in fact arrived at their final verdict. But the, the um, jury deliberations have traditionally been shouted in secret. We don't know how they arrive at their decisions. We hope that we understand these complex directions we give them in a very short space of time. Sometimes they'll come back and ask for jury questions and you, uh, the sheriff has to uh, give them uh, concise uh, um, answers and you hope that they've understood those as well. Occasionally you will get a verdict that you cannot understand from a jury. Uh, but by and large they do their best. Um, but it may be that before we come to the view that 10 out of 12 is really a safe level we should look more at how, in fact, they actually arrive at their verdicts in the first place. Yes, Mr. Wolf. Yes, uh, can I, first of all, um, as I understand it, in common law systems, um, the norm is unanimity or near unanimity. Um, the second point is perhaps that this very difference of opinion on this one issue illustrates why um, what we uh, uh, need to do is to look at the system at large um, and at all the elements with a view to securing uh, a system which gets the balance right between making sure that we can effectively prosecute crimes, including those crimes, those sexual crimes and domestic abuse, cri uh, crimes of domestic abuse which rightly raise public concern, the balance between effective prosecution uh, and uh, uh, avoiding miscarriages of justice. I'm going to move on as time presses. Sandra, followed by Alison, followed by John, followed by Christian. Uh, th thank you very much, Kevin, and, and good morning. I'm glad that Mr Wolf had raised the issue of domestic violence and, and crimes as well. Uh, last week we were given figures of uh, hundreds, you know, percentage figures of hundreds of uh, domestic violence and rape crimes which don't reach the courts. And obviously it was very concerning, and obviously we're looking at the, uh, the, the corroboration. Now, I mentioned that particular case because I think Mr Harrah constantly mentions the one case down south of a miscarriage of justice. But here we have hundreds of cases, I would say, a miscarriage of justice, because justice is for victims also, 
basically, and I think that's what we're looking at in the in the round in, in this uh, this bill. Now, the Lord Advocate has said that corroboration requirement means he's unable to prosecute many of the crimes committed simply because it's taking place in private, and this is not it can be children and elderly people also. Even though the support of evidence, persuasive support of evidence, because corroboration rule is not met. Now, if corroboration remains, what can you, as experts, I presume, in the justice system, suggest uh, we can put in place to ensure that, you know, victims do get justice in these cases? Mr. Wolf. Yes, I and mean, the first thing to say is that there's understandable public concern about these categories of cases and they are rightly ones to be taken extremely seriously. Uh, the second point to make is that um, the Lord Advocate, as I recall it, gave uh, uh, statistics for the numbers of cases within these categories which were marked for no prosecution uh, on the basis there was insufficient evidence. And, um, uh, Alison McKinnis then asked, uh, if I may say, a very pertinent question, which is how many of those would, in, would be prosecuted uh, applying the new test? So it's important to recognise that, at least on the Lord Advocate's uh, 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 own view of his own test, that not every case in which a, a complaint of sexual crime or domestic abuse is brought will be prosecuted. And so I think one has to be slightly careful about the numbers that one looks at. The third point is it's important to understand that abolishing corroboration is not a panacea for the difficulties which these cases raise. And Mark Harrower has already identified some of the difficulties which I suspect certainly any of us who've prosecuted uh, serious sexual crime uh, 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 will recognize uh, in prosecuting those crimes. Uh, the fourth point is that those of us who've prosecuted these crimes recognize the value of corroborating evidence uh, in supporting the evidence of a complainer and in persuading uh, a jury to accept the evidence of the complainer, particularly if you have a complainer who, for a variety of reasons, uh, 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 may be a, a difficult witness. The corroborating evidence may be extremely important, and it's therefore very important that we don't uh, uh, end up with a system in which there's any diminution in the efforts put into making sure that all evidence is, uh, uh, all investigations are carried out uh, uh, and evidence uh, 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 obtained. I don't suggest that there might not be room for examining the way that corroboration works. Um, uh, Lord Hope has suggested, if I understand it correctly, that one might look again at the role that distress plays uh, in corroborating uh, the different elements of a, of a sexual crime. Uh, one might look at uh, 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 the corroboration of crimes by reference to facts and circumstances which are consistent with the complainer's uh, account. I don't wish to commit the faculty to a view on these points, but, 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 but I, 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 don't, I don't suggest that there isn't a, a, a case to e examine the way that corroboration works uh, in dealing with these uh, crimes. Uh, nor do I for a moment suggest that the issues in relation to these particular crimes uh, don't create a case for examining whether corroboration is a, a doctrine that we should retain or not. Our fundamental concern, though, is that if you're going to take it away, and ultimately there's a serious policy question uh, uh, about that or not, then you have to appreciate that the whole system will look completely different at every stage, at investigation stage, prosecution stage, trial stage, appeal stage. And one has to look very hard at whether, as the academics from Glasgow say, we're not leaving ourselves with a system that uh, 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 fundamentally runs an unacceptable risk of uh, uh, unfair trials taking place in this country. Anyone else wish to address that? No? I yes, sir. Sorry, yes. Th thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for that and I absolutely agree with you know, basically what you said about uh, the numbers and the Lord Advocate was very honest about that but there were still high 
in comparison to some other crimes. I just wanted to pick up on some of the stuff that Mr McMenamin said, following on about the corroboration, and no one has said what can be put in its place. We were talking about corroboration being removed from other countries. Uh, Mr McMenamin, you said, obviously, in England, there's a section for vulnerable people under the Mental Health Act, and Holland also. But you also mentioned that we rely on it more, corroboration more. And then further on down, you said that corroboration has been whittled down to almost nothing. So I just wanted, when we're talking about corroboration as being, you know, a separate issue, it's been whittled down even more and we use it even more. Could you maybe elaborate a bit more on that? Why would we need to keep corroboration as it stands at the moment if we rely on it too much and it's been whittled down to almost nothing? Over the years, there have been quite a number of cases before the Appeal Court in which they've addressed corroboration in various areas of law, I'll not uh, go into the details uh, of these particular cases, but suffice to say that not everything has to be corroborated, uh, that the essentials of a criminal case have to be corroborated, A, that there was a crime committed, and B, the identity of the person who committed the crime. We have corroboration in such cases for these essential matters as a check, as a system of safeguarding against miscarriages of justice. I think it's correct that in certain aspects, certain evidential aspects, corroboration has diminished in that uh, the application of what has been called the corroboration doctrine today uh, does not apply as strongly in certain evidential aspects as it does in others. But at the present time, if you're going to convict somebody in a court of law of committing a crime, then you need a system of checks and balances to avoid miscarriages of justice. And corroboration at the present time is what we have. We have nothing else of any substance. So it's important that we acknowledge that and until we can come up with something to replace it, we might never come up with anything to replace it that would satisfy everybody, of course, but until something else can be found, uh, I suggest that corroboration has to stay. You say that corroboration has been whittled down, but I think the Lord Advocate, and I'm looking at the official report from Wednesday at column 3745, when he said, can I tell you what effect corroboration has? We have to corroborate the taking of buccal swabs from alleged offenders. So two police officers are required for that. We have to corroborate taking of intimate swabs from a complainer in a rape case. In the case of child pornography, we need to corroborate the children are under the age of 16. So that must be done by two witnesses. We have to corroborate forensic analysis. So two forensic scientists have to speak to the results for examination and so on. That doesn't sound like whittling down to me, um, you know. Care to address that, having said it's whittled down to almost nothing? Yeah, well, in certain areas, as I mentioned before, forensic science evidence, for example, the Crown can serve notice that they're only going to call one forensic scientist. Now, it might mean in the course of inquiries that they have two forensic scientists. That's so. They will have two forensic science pre scientists prepare a report. But uh, when it comes to service of indictment, the Crown are entitled to give notice that they only intend to call one witness. So I accept that's the collecting of evidence. So we, should we be looking at that part as well? Should any alleged inquiry or review into corroboration look at the requirements of corroboration in the collection of evidence as well as in court proceedings? Yes, uh, I, I think there is scope for looking at the application of corroboration throughout the evidential Process. procedure uh, and also perhaps in relation to the classes of cases in which it might apply. That's something I think that's worthy of debate. Sorry to interrupt, just that nobody had raised that. And I know that that was what the Lord Advocate made a point about. He says, that's where I'm coming from. So that seemed to be very substantial to him uh, in giving evidence last week. Anyway, you've addressed it. Thank you. Sorry, yeah. Sandra. No, that's fine. I was going to you know, go a bit further on. I think you've, you've clarified some of the points as well. But you mentioned, obviously, about the corroboration and we don't have anything else. And I did ask previously if anyone's got any ideas what else you could, you could have as guidelines. Obviously, we've got the jury. Some say that's fine, changes. Some say it's not. And obviously, the judge being able to take it 
away from the jury. Would you agree with those two aspects of it? I'm not just speaking to Mr McMenamin. Obviously, the, the rest Mr McMenamin's giving the, you the yes, eye in that, yeah, as if you're communicating you know, there. Because obviously, there's an idea that's been put forward, and, and where I have a wee bit of confusion, probably a lot of confusion through a lot of the things, is the fact that we're looking at this criminal justice bill in the round, and as Mr Wolfe has said, it's not just one part, there's lots of different parts to it. But if you were to take corroboration out of this bill and look at it separately, how would that, what would be the knock-on effect if you, we yeah. pass the rest of the bill without the corroborative part of it? Sorry. Well, just give them a I think the bill, just, can, just could we take it out, it the bill could stand and, and yes, proceed? Uh, the position of the Law Society is that uh, all matters which are subject to the bills should have been... Uh, subject to consideration on a, a wider scale than, that, than has been so already. But we are where we are. And uh, as has been suggested, if corroboration and indeed the provision regarding jury numbers is taken out of the bill, then uh, we would uh, support that at the present time. And we would support also further consideration being given to these aspects. I think I was struggling for a wrecking amendment. If you took it out, the bill would still... No, but Mr Wolfe? Uh, it seems to me the only provision which is, um, although not logically in practical terms, linked with the abolition of corroboration is the increase in the uh, majority required in the, for the jury. Uh, and I should say, as the committee will appreciate, the faculty supports or, or broadly supports uh, uh, many parts of this bill. And in particular, while we've made some observations, the um, uh, provisions in part one relating to arrest and custody. Uh, and the faculty would certainly um, uh, welcome uh, the specific, uh, uh, taking out the specific um, provision dealing with corroboration and the one associated provision related to uh, jury majority, precisely so that uh, the, those other parts of the bill can uh, uh, proceed uh, swiftly to enactment. Thank you. Thank you. Alison, followed by John, please. Thank you. Um, can I re um, refer members to my register of interest and the fact that I'm a member of the Council of Justice Scotland? Um, I want to return to a couple of points and then maybe, if I have time, touch on one new thing. Um, John Finney talked to touch on something new. Yes. <laughs> John, John Finney talked about access to justice, and I, 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 I do just want to pursue whether or not um, the panel share my concerns that um, this whole issue seems to be driven by giving victims their day in court rather than about the need um, to secure prosecutions in the public interest, and, and whether or not that's a dangerous uh, road to go down. Secondly, um, turning to the points that Mr Harrower made um, in, in detail about um, the prosecutorial guidance um, and the decisions to pursue certain cases regardless, in a way, because they were sensitive, perhaps politically. Um, I wonder if the panel would consider, beyond the dangers of individual miscarriages of justice, whether these profound changes in the hands of a less benign government might be significantly constitutional. Less uh, benign, I think you just, <laughs> I think you could be in the minister the way you're going here this <laughs> sense the new coalition. Mr Harrower. Thank you. Um, many solicitors do worry about some of the emphases being placed on certain types of case in court. All types of case that go to court are important. The consequences in all cases are important for the people affected by it. We do seem to be concentrating on certain types of case very much. I do understand the drivers for, uh, for such as uh, the focus on domestic abuse, which obviously has been a problem in Scotland. The problem is when you see it in practice being applied, you see very wide nets being cast and you see every single type of case uh, categorised as, for example, domestic abuse being brought into court, people appearing from custody regularly. I mean, the, the numbers in Edinburgh Sheriff Court have um, gone up substantially this year as far as prosecutions are concerned. There's been a, since April this year, there's been a 50% increase in uh, cases registered in the GP court, where we now see fairly serious road traffic cases. And of course, there's a, there's a policing drive on road traffic at the moment. We've seen a 38% increase in cases registered in the Sheriff Court, where, of course, there are drives such as domestic abuse, the, the, the football legislation. Um, we just worry that um, 
there seems to be an ever-increasing desire to cast a very wide net and let the courts sort it out, put more cases into court and let the judges and juries make a decision. Unfortunately, when you do that, you, you, you end up catching all sorts of cases and perhaps cases which could be dealt with in other ways. Um, I do think that uh, there are um, that there is a political drive behind this review. Um, I do think that um, the government obviously is under pressure from various groups. But we've got to remember that um, we have come across these problems in the past. I mean, in, in, in days gone by, there was a particular concern about people being robbed on the highways when there were no other witnesses around. Now, um, those were crimes committed in private. But back then, we were able to resist the temptation to remove corroboration, which would have obviously dealt with that problem. Now we have a similar type of problem, a different section of society affected by it. Um, we have um, the media really um, highlighting these issues, and the public, I think, understand the problems. What we've got to do as a justice system is make sure we don't make rash decisions, and make, because once you get rid of corroboration, it's gone. And in my sub submission, that would be to the detriment of our system unless we have properly thought out checks and balances in its place. Okay. Mr. White. Thank you. Um, to address those two points, if I may, um, I'm not sure I'd um, characterise the first of them in precisely the same terms, um, but uh, I'd like to repeat something I've said already, which is uh, there is the danger, I think, here of extrapolating from a narrow range of dreadful cases, no doubt, um, but the suggestion is not that um, uh, the requirement for corroboration be re uh, removed from sexual assault, domestic abuse, but from everything, theft, ordinary assaults, breach of the peace, and so on. Um, turning to the second point, the less benign government point, um, something which uh, has been touched on, I think, but not specifically addressed uh, this morning. Uh, sorry, I beg your pardon. Mr. Wolfe did, um, I think, address it um, and described it as the constitutional point. Um, it's not entirely clear to me why the new test post-corroboration should not be put into statute. Thank you. Anyone else wish to? No. Yep, I think Ms. Mr. Wolf wants to. Yeah, sorry, oh, so I beg your this? pardon. I beg your pardon. Yes. Yes. Uh, regarding the point made about whether this is motivated uh, by giving victims a day in court, well, put bluntly, it should never be motivated by giving victims a day in court. In fact, uh, victims are not victims until it's been established in court that they are victims, first of all. Secondly, uh, it should always, as, as I think Mr Finney mentioned earlier on, uh, be a case of prosecution in the public interest. Now, it may, in certain circumstances, <coughs> not be in the public interest to put a single witness in court to give evidence. It may not even be in the uh, interest of that particular witness to stand in a court of law with no backup evidence, be cross-examined at length and find that uh, the accused is acquitted. Uh, and I think also going back to the point about there being perhaps hundreds of cases that could be brought to court, I think it's very easy to, for some people to be swayed by the numbers game here. You cannot approach it on that basis. You have to look at each case individually and decide whether it's appropriate to bring a prosecution, whether it's in the public interest. Mr. Wolf, you, are you wanting to? Yes. So uh, I wonder if I might just uh, make an observation on, on, on the last part of the question. Um, um, because it, it is important to have in mind the constitutional significance of what we're doing here. Um, we're putting in place or considering the way in which the criminal justice system operates and ultimately we should all be concerned about securing the rule of law in Scotland for the long term. Um, and that's why our, our fundamental focus here is on um, the safeguards which are required in order to make sure that notwithstanding changes of Lord Advocate, notwithstanding changes of government, changes of um, social attitudes, moral panics about one thing or another, um, that we have a system of criminal justice which secures uh, the liberties of, of, of the citizen um, in Scotland, while at the same time 
uh, ensuring that those who commit crimes uh, can be brought to, to, to book. And that's why, that's why the faculty uh, welcomes the debate that this, uh, the, the, this, the, the, this whole, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the putting on the agenda of this issue has uh, uh, given rise to. But it's also why the faculty can't support the proposals in this bill uh, and, uh, and would welcome uh, a much broader review of the criminal justice system. Um, the, the new point is that in tandem to considering the um, legislation in front of us, we're also considering a petition which calls for the retrospective application of the removal of co corroboration. It would be useful to have on the record um, the panel's view on uh, the implications of such a, such a move. Mr. White. If I can leap in, I would say there are almost never any justifications for any retrospective criminal legislation. Yeah. Okay. Two words, unworkable and inappropriate. <laughs> uh, fundamentally unconstitutional. Thank you. I agree with uh, the other contributors. Thank you. Thank you. That, yes, it's, it was, we need to put the point down as well. John, followed by Christian, that would be the last question, because you've had a long session, time moves on. John. Thank you, convener. Uh, as someone who's not too long on the Justice Committee, you can fully understand that my knowledge of the legal system has been severely stretched and uh, I think that taking that on board but the way I'm looking at it just now is that what we have here is a proposal for the uh, abolition of corroboration and uh, from that what I find is two teams i.e. yourselves and that of the, the Lord Advocate now where I find the difference is in the Lord Advocate submission he highlights quite clearly you know that the system perhaps needs modernised. You know for some of the reasons that's been outlined here. You know with the fact that you know nearly 2,800 vic no victims, but uh, potential victims have not had their day in the court. And I probably agree that perhaps the day in the court uh, is not the terminology, but that it should be that their opportunity for justice being seen to be done. Now where the Lord. Uh, advocate has come up with ideas what I, prim what I think probably would have been more helpful for myself is that this is now the second session that we've had in corroboration and the witnesses last week and indeed yourselves have not been helpful in the extent that where you've spoke about you know we need to change you've never come up with any uh, modifications that would certainly help the people who we believe are not getting access to the, the, the system. Is it too early for you to ask? Do you have any fresh ideas which would help those people that, 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 that we feel are failing, that the system's failing? Do you have any ideas about how we could, you know, work uh, the way forward to making sure that these people do get their opportunity? And is there, a, is there somewhere along the lines where, uh, you know, there could be a consensus between yourselves and indeed the, uh, the proposal here, because what I've also heard here is that, you know, the, the kind of grenades uh, getting thrown into the ring that, you know, the prosecutor's office may not be up to speed to deal with all those uh, uh, convictions that may be, you know, the, the, the people who come to, to see them. And, you know, and I just find that we're, you know, rather than trying to come to a solution, you know, we're finding ourselves that we're going to be miles and miles apart and uh, so I'm just wondering if you have any ideas just now as to how, and I think that would have been helpful for me to try and at least for me to understand what would be best for, for, for us for access to justice. I, I heard Mr White saying, um, perhaps Mr White would expand on that, perhaps we need to look at, in particular cases, uh, corroboration, which is, I think, you, the issue you're raising, you know, and that surprised me a bit because I thought we would be looking what would apply in, any case should be similar, but, but perhaps you could help us, help John, if you expand on that. Well, I certainly don't deny saying those words, um, but I have no recollection of saying those words. <laughs> Dear, well, we'll uh, check the order. Yes, the week. Uh, which, which I um, uh, certainly trust. Uh, certainly, I did not wish to be understood to be proposing that there be corroboration in some cases and not in others. I think it was the what constituted corroboration, not, uh, that's what I thought the inference was, and it would have fit, fitted in, I think, with something that was said about 
I think, can't remember who it was, it's been such a long morning about it's gone to almost nothing. Mr McMenamin, I think you used that expression. I think if you could help us with that, if there's any way forward uh, to reconcile the Lord Advocate's position, which we understand, and we certainly understand the difficulty for domestic abuse, sexual assault, cases like that, and, and genuinely people who are not having a remedy in terms of criminal law and, and where, we, where we are with corroboration. Well, first of all, it may have been uh, myself who said that the, it's perhaps worth looking at what categories of cases. It might have been. Corroboration. Well. I beg your pardon, Mr. White. Yeah. Um, my basis for that, very quickly, was that I know that in the United States there has been application uh, in certain jurisdictions to particular types of cases, which is not something I'm suggesting, something perhaps worth looking at. As simple as in, that. In an overall review. In an overall system. review, exactly. But I think. No, if you'll forgive me, um, I'm not going to come up with any solutions today, and I'd be very surprised if any of my colleagues here do come up with any uh, examples or solutions to the situation. What we're dealing with here is a very complex situation. Corroboration at times can be a very complex area. It has occupied the time of the appeal court in this country rather a lot over the last few decades. But what do you have to uh, acknowledge is that that is a system that is developed here and to move away from it would be a seismic shift for uh, this country. Uh, and you also have to take into account that uh, for all that the Lord Advocate has stated his argument uh, for the abolition of corroboration, um, <coughs> people who are against the abolition of corroboration, certainly at the present time, uh, consist of the major legal institutions in this country, uh, the Scottish Law Commission, the Faculty of Advocates, the Law Society of Scotland, uh, the Police Federation, I understand, and almost all of the Shrievel bench. Now, if that doesn't tell you something, then I think, frankly, it ought to, that to discard corroboration in the light of the opinion of these bodies is a rash act, and perhaps a foolish one. It's worthy, as we've all said, of greater debate and greater consideration. Mr. Wolf. Yes. Um, th th there is, of course, a, 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 a perfectly uh, respectable uh, uh, view that the doctrine of corroboration, as we have developed it over, over uh, a long period of time, reflects uh, that practical common sense notion that you want to cross check. Um, evidence from more than one independent source before you bring a case into court on the essential, essential facts. Uh, but uh, as I said earlier, I wouldn't for a moment suggest that there isn't a case for looking at the way corroboration works in relation to uh, uh, certain types of cases. I, I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't uh, immediately be attracted by a system that says corroboration for some kinds of cases and not for others. Although it's interesting that for some time, as I understand it in the law of England and Wales, corroboration was only required in sexual cases, precisely because of some of the difficulties that those cases uh, present. Um, but just to illustrate some of the uh, things that might be examined, um, I mentioned earlier the um, question of the role that distress plays. At the moment, it plays quite a, a limited role. It can corroborate certain elements of the crime, but not others. That might be capable of being looked at. Uh, what, what, what one might examine um, the question of corroboration of, 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 of mens rea. These are issues that, that could be looked at. Uh, and as I said earlier, I wouldn't wish to commit myself to a view on them. You mentioned facts and circumstances as well. I, I, indeed, and, and, and the question yes. of whether, it, it, whether one needs to have um, an independent source of evidence that positively incriminates rather than simply providing that cross-check of consistency. Mm -hmm. um, so there may, uh, uh, there may well be ways in which the doctrine itself could be uh, adjusted. Um, uh, 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 as I say, uh, uh, I don't come with a, a, a menu or prescription um, uh, that, that, that these are necessarily uh, the right way to go. Um, and then, of course, ultimately, I suppose what... Uh, uh, but, but I suppose what's interesting to notice is the Lord Advocate himself in his guidelines is not, is not by any means suggesting 
that um, the cross-check is, is uh, unimportant or, or, or not uh, uh, useful. Um, but then there's uh, uh, an ultim but ultimately the question is if you if you're uh, uh, the question that's before you as, as as legislators is the abolition of corroboration, and you have to look at that in the context of the other things that are being done by way of adjusting and compensating in a system that up until now has been uh, in ways which are. Um, uh, can't be overemphasized, are, f are f uh, fundamentally based on that doctrine as, as, as it being at the heart of our criminal justice system. So the end point for, for the Faculty of Advocates is not to say that there, isn't, there aren't things that one might wish to look at, there is not to say that there isn't a debate to be had, but that the proposal in this bill to abolish corroboration uh, with the very limited adjustment to the jury verdict uh, majority uh, and with no, yep. no additional safeguards in summary cases, is not something that faculty can support. I don't want us to go round over old ground again, Hugh. Anything else to add no, to that? Uh, I think it was an a good question, John. I think that is the issue no, for the just, committee. Uh, I just think it's a, a, a pity convener that, you know, that, you know where this uh, sort of suggestion was made that, that, you know, modifications could be found or solutions, you know, that unless I'm picking Mr McMahon him up, I think he's already, mind has already made up on that because, you know, in an answer to Sandra White, you said it's unlikely, you know, that we would support any, any change and indeed I think it's rash that it's here in the first place. So I'm just wondering if, if uh, you know, we, if we're to try and help those uh, victims who don't get their justice in court, then I think sometimes, you know, that, that you, you may have to open your mind up a little bit, Mr McMenamin. Well, no, the, the Law Society's position is that we are prepared. We've invited people to come and debate this. We are prepared to look yes. at the overall situation. What I think is utterly illogical is to approach it on the basis of, oh, well, what have you got to replace corroboration? Nothing. Well, let's get rid of corroboration. Mm. And that's the situation we're in just now. Mr. White, you were wanted to come you. in. I was just going to say, uh, it seems to be, in essence, perhaps, Mr. Pentland's point is this. Um, evidence was heard last week suggesting that um, corroboration um, ought to be um, uh, entirely abolished. Um, evidence is heard uh, this week suggesting that is not an appropriate um, uh, course to follow, and he's asking, is there no middle point? Um, I think the reply, at the risk of going over old ground, is that, uh, firstly, there was, of course, the, the further consultation paper on um, safeguards, which, was, I have to say, it seemed to me a little perfunctory, mentioning two or three things about juries, essentially. But the main point, I think, which I, I think all four people this morning at this end of the table have said, is that uh, perhaps the, the distance between these um, positions is the very reason for referring this to the Law Commission or a Royal Commission or a Departmental Committee or whatever it might be. Yes. There may be middle points. Nobody's looked for them. Right, so I'm just a good... I'm moving on now. Last question, Christian. Give, bearing in mind we've been nearly two hours at this and got more work to do yet. Christian. <laughs> good morning. It's <Not> <laughs> the yet. afternoon. <laughs> um, I would like uh, some clarification. Clarification regarding what we heard this morning and what we heard last week from Lord Gill. I... As I understand it, we're talking about the removal, removing the requirement for corroboration. But this morning we hear that that will take corroboration out of the system altogether, uh, that it will discard co uh, corroboration or nothing uh, uh, to uh, replace corroboration with. Uh, is there a case that in other system, like we heard this morning, there is a, a lot of corroborations in a lot of cases, in other justi judicial system. And even if the requirement for corroborations is not there, it's still used extensively in, 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 in a lot of justice system. And therefore, if you, if you uh, think that we can uh, remove the requirement for corroboration, but still have corroborations in the system, uh, will the, the evidence that Law Gill gave last week uh, will not make sense uh, in, 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 in that future because it, it was very, very clear and he said the legislation must apply across the board. And do you agree on this? Because I heard this morning some of you maybe not agreed on this. Well, it will be difficult to 
create different classes of case, some of which require corroboration, some don't, because very often cases come to court with a number of different charges on them. And say, for example, you've got one complainer who has alleged a number of different types of crime against the same person. How do you explain to a jury, well, charges one and two do not require corroboration, but charges three and four do? It's, I mean, directions, juries absorb a lot of directions in a, a short space of time already, and it's difficult for them to, sometimes for them to get their heads around it, but they do their best. I think it will make it very complicated if we create certain classes of case where corroboration is not required. I think what, uh, what we are saying... An example for, um, you know, for the complaint, the kind of... A complaint that would have elements to it, some of which, you know, that you did assault, you know, that kind Certainly. of thing, so that the well, committee and the public understand your example, point about it. Yeah. If, if you had a complainer who alleged rape at knife point, you might have a charge of uh, rape and say you removed the requirement of corroboration, then the evidence of rape could come from the complainer alone whether you had other evidence of penetration at all. But if there was an accompanying charge of possession of a knife in a public place, um, then you might need, uh, yeah. perversely, another witness to come along and say this man actually had a knife in a public place. In practice, the Crown probably wouldn't, wouldn't be too bothered about that additional charge. But try and explain that to the jury. If that charge does go to the jury, you need two witnesses for that charge, but not for that charge. Or you may have a, a, an accompanying charge of some, some act on the part of the accused to try and destroy or get rid of evidence. Again, would you make that the type of charge which requires two sources of evidence or just the one? So what Lord Gill is saying is it would be very complicated, a complicated exercise to try and uh, make different classes of case, some of which require corroboration and some don't. I think that um, if you are determined to remove the, uh, or to weaken the evidential requirements, which effectively getting rid of corroboration would be, in order to improve access to justice, uh, this is a question, going back to Mr. Benton's question, and give witnesses their day in court, then you've got to understand it would not be the only consequence. It would not, the only consequence would not simply be more cases would go into court. What else would, would you be achieving? Well, I do not think, and I don't think any of the contributors have heard to the consultation, including Lord Carloway, can say that you would achieve more convictions. In fact, Lord Gill is quite clear that he believes you would in increase, uh, you would achieve a decrease in the conviction rate. And it stands to reason, if you're weakening the, 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 the amount of evidence you need, then you're even less likely to get convictions in cases, in the types of cases where juries are already um, reluctant to convict. And, and what will be the knock-on effect of that? What will be the, what will be the knock-on effect of that for the system? If more and more people have been acquitted of this sort of, sort of crime, then it's not going to in, uh, increase public confidence in the system at all. And if you do, as a result of that, produce one or two high-profile miscarriages of justice cases, then those cases will be very costly for the system, not just in terms of, of finances, because um, appeals to the SCCRC uh, are, are very costly. If you, if you end up overturning a conviction, you're paying out compensation. And then many years down the line, sometimes you've got people coming out of prison and the public are wondering what went wrong. These, these, these cases are very costly for the system, both in terms of money and in terms of public confidence. And we have, up until now, managed to avoid them for a reason. And corroboration, to me, is the main reason. If I can press you on what you just said about the rate of conviction, I did press Lord Gill on that particular subject. Can you give me the column? Uh, it's 3727. 3727. Mm -hmm. On access to justice, would abolishing corporation increase the number of cases, I asked him, uh, uh, brought to, uh, to prosecution? And he answered no. When I pressed him, definitely not. His answer was, it might increase the number of prosecutions, but I'm not convinced but it would increase the number of convictions. Yeah. Would what do you think? I, 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 agree with, I agree with that. I mean, if you're going to have more uh, cases where there is deemed to be enough evidence, then you will increase the number of cases going to court. All these additional cases that Lord Advocate talked about would potentially end up in our courts. But the conviction rate, the number of these cases, the percentage of these cases where you actually achieve a conviction, I don't see how that can do anything other than stay the same or fall. I have uh, figures for 2011, 2012, um, rape and attempted rape, um, there were 20 acquitted not guilty 2011-2012, 16 acquitted not proven, 50 charge proved. So that was 36 acquitted, 50 charge proved, and an additional eight were um, not guilty accepted or deserted. So it's, it's just about 50-50 at the moment. And, um, These are figures from 
what you? This is this is uh, from the um, statistical bulletin produced by the government uh, on the 27th of November last year for the figures financial year 2011-2012. Uh -huh. right, thank and you. And on page 23 is given a table of uh, people proceeded against in court and uh, a breakdown of the outcomes. No, we heard that's fine. They've got the reference for the official report. Yes. So interesting. And you know we're not saying. Nobody's saying that juries aren't doing their jobs properly. Nobody's saying that juries are going into court and trying to find a way to acquit people. Juries are going to court at the moment with corroborated evidence and they're not being convinced. So how do we expect to increase that when we're taking away one of the major checks on, on, on the truth of the allegation that's being put to them? I'm sorry, unless anybody else wants to, can I just stop the question? Do, Mr. No, I don't think Mr. White does. Do, no, Mr. Wolf, yes. I, I wonder if I might just make two very brief observations. The first is that, uh, like Mr. Harrow, I, 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 I'm not attracted by having different rules for different types of crime, and that's why I'm pretty diffident about offering possible modifications, well worth looking at, but one would have to look at them very hard. The second point is about the consequences upon uh, the, the question of the conviction rate. One of the real problems we have is we just don't know. Now, Lord Gill talked about you know, unknown, as yet unknown consequences, and he was right to do so because at first blush, one might expect the rate of conviction for sexual crimes to decrease because one's prosecuting crimes with a, a lesser evidential basis. But at the same time, across the board, we are removing a requirement for corroboration. Uh, judges will no longer be upholding no case to answer submissions. Juries will no longer be being told that they must find corroborated evidence. And for all yet seen, there might be across the board, uh, and not in sexual cases, an increase in the conviction rate. But whether that will be so, and if so, what the implications will be for the system and, and, and the resourcing of the system, it's, it's, it's really anybody's guess. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm looking at the clock and thinking we've all had a long session. I want to thank you very much, the witnesses. Uh, I'm going to resume in five minutes, committee, on the next session. And my apologies to the next witnesses who are still waiting. So we just suspend for five minutes, please.
We're back, and can, I'm just going to put on the record, we're all cold. I don't know who's in charge of the heating in here, but could I ask members next week to bring in portable radiators just to make a symbolic, we're all cold, so cold that even people sitting in the public gallery have had to take coffee to warm themselves up. Now there's a first, although they weren't allowed near the muffins. Um, or perhaps they got them when my back was turned. But it, I apologise to our witnesses as well, because I've suggested to put their coats on, it's so cold in here. Unfortunately, we've brought our coats with us. Um, I now move on to the next item of the agenda. Again, I thank you all for waiting. That was a, I'm sure you would agree from all aspects, a very important session uh, on the Criminal Justice Bill, which I'm sure you're also very interested in. So item two is the Antisocial Behaviour, Crime and Policing uh, Legislative Consent Motion. And it's in relation to a bill currently progressing through the House of Lords. And today we're hearing evidence specifically on the force managed provisions in the bill. Now, welcome to the meeting, Detective Chief Superintendent Gillian Imere, Police Scotland, Mur Murdal Wadawa, correct? Oh. <laughs> from Shakti Women's Aid, Lily Greenham of uh, Scotland's Women's Aid and Katrina Dorimple, Head of Policy, Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. And uh, my apologies to your colleague who had to leave, waited such a long time, but it had to leave for important reasons. And can I just go straight to questions from members, please? Margaret. Uh, good morning, Prime I wonder if we could look at the whole uh, issue of the Istanbul Convention, uh, mm -hmm. Convention yeah. I, I think um, Women's Aid submission has suggested that the current law and the civil uh, approach to it, where it's only criminalised if there's a breach, is compliant with um, art the article in the Istanbul Convention, whereas police Scotland, I think, and perhaps um, the Cabinet Secretary is suggesting it isn't. Could we look at that aspect? Now, if you just let me know who wants to, to say I'll, I'll make sure you might first I'll call your name. Who wants to start? Right, Ms Greenham. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Ms Mitchell, for that question. The Istanbul Convention requires that pa state parties that wish to ratify the Convention um, ensure that forced marriage is criminalised in their state. Our argument is that forced marriage is already criminalised in Scotland through a number of provisions in common law and in statute, and that there is no need to create a specific offence of forced marriage. Um, our sister organisations in England, um, sort of particularly Southall Black Sisters, Imkan and Dr Aisha Gill, have also argued um, that there is no requirement to criminalise forced marriage or create a specific offence for England and Wales for the same reason that there is legislation already available either through common law or through statute um, that is sufficient and that criminalising it will be counterproductive. Does everyone nodding, uh, um, I agree. I, I don't think that we need to have a specific legislation um, to criminalise forced marriage. A lot of the behaviour that we see um, uh, around the issue of forced marriage in situations where forced marriage arises um, is already criminalised, so we don't really need a specific uh, uh, law against that. How, how is it criminalised? Just for the record, how is it currently criminalised? We'll come to Ms Emery. Well, um, a lot of the behaviour that we see in the forced marriage cases that we've dealt with, um, that could be criminalised in terms of abduction, illegal confinement, uh, physical assault, all of those factors are already criminalised. Um, if we are talking about uh, criminalising forced marriage, we, uh, it, it, it is problematic for, for us at Shakti Women's Aid because we don't see forced marriage as an event. We see uh, forced marriage as a process. Um, it is not a wedding. It is a process that starts for many people when they are children and it can end when they are adults or even much older than, you know, in, in their 30s and 40s. So what exactly are you going to criminalize in that process? There's a lot of behavior as part of that process that, that is already criminalized. And I think we don't really need a specific legislation around that. That's one of the arguments. Yes. Thank you, convener. Um, I think what we do I should all... call you Detective Chief Superintendent, I hear your title. Yes. Not at all. Um... <laughs> Not at all. Uh, all right. <laughs> Shorter to call you, Ms. Emery. Right. I think what we all agree on is that forced marriage is unacceptable and fundamentally wrong. Um, so there is no, there is no, no. dissent um, 
in, in our um, view on that matter. Uh, and clearly the position of the police is to enforce whatever the law of the land is. Um, so, and, and, and that is that is our role. The best uh, response would be that of prevention and the forced marriage protection orders do allow us um, to intervene and we do have uh, seven of those orders in place in Scotland live at the moment um, and the breach of such an order is a criminal offence uh, but forced yeah, marriage in itself is not so that's what appears on, on the face of things to be uh, somewhat anomalous. Um, the point about making forced marriage a specific crime as opposed to using common law or statute offences that currently exist is the message that it conveys loud and clear the point that I started with that forced marriage is fundamentally wrong and it's a message to those who are um, perhaps uh, potential victims of forced marriage as well as those who uh, might be perpetrators of that or labouring under an illusion that that is acceptable. Uh, that is the reason why um, Police Scotland feel that it is helpful to make it a criminal offence in its own right. Um, and the argument about driving it underground, frankly, uh, it's already underground. Um, the forced marriage protection orders that we do have relate to, uh, in the main, six out of the seven relate to children, all of which have come to us through child protection procedures, and those would still come to us through that same route, and we would still have the option that we're using right now for a forced marriage protection order. Just could you clarify, thank you for the additional submission, you say there were seven forced marriage protection orders in Scotland granted, six out of the seven were children. Um, what age are we talking about? Well, they range from as young as 11 through to 16. There's only one of those is, is actually 16, so a couple of 13-year-olds, 15-year-olds. I take it these are not live proceedings, so we can talk about... I'm just interested to see at what stage. Live. You said it was a process. They are live. Yes. They are interim forced marriage protection orders, and, to that, and because of the small numbers, I would I would be unable to be absolutely. very specific because I'll be in danger of identifying yes. the individual. Absolutely, involved. no, absolutely, that's why I asked. Yes, um, yes, please, Ms. Dodrum. Thank you. Um, I just would like to, to to state that Scotland's prosecution service will work within whatever criminal law that the Parliament sees. Well, we would hope so. We hope you would <laughs> work out with yes. it. Yes. No, we will. It, it, obviously, I just want to stress that it is a matter <laughs> for the Parliament. Um, we recognise as prosecutors that the issue of forced marriage is a very complicated one. And I think there is a need to recognise that a prosecutorial response may not always be the most effective. And we would continue to work with the support agencies and the police to ensure that the most effective response was the one that was taken um, for the best interests of, of the people involved. You asked, I think, initially in relation to effective criminal sanctions, are, are they already in place? There are a variety of offences um, that, uh, that could be taken into consideration when you're looking at the issues surrounding um, things like abduction, assault, sexual offences. But I do have a concern that it doesn't cover the full spectrum of behaviours involved in forced marriage. There are psychological, emotional, financial, community pressures, honour pressures, where there is not necessarily any force or violence um, or abuse involved, um, but it offers intense pressures for individuals. The new offence in the, the legislative consent motion it talks about violence, threats, or any other form of coercion. Um, and, and that may be easier to fit into some of the circumstances that these individuals may face. And I just, I just wanted to highlight to that committee. I think the reason that we adopted this different system in, in Scotland was um, a fear. If it was criminalised outline, then victims wouldn't come forward. And we thought this was a good halfway house, you know, just to, to encourage people to come forward with all the things you've just said, Ms. Mr. Rimpel, the threat, the violence, all of that. Now, um, it seems to me, Police Scotland, and it wasn't quite what I took from um, Miss Emery, but more from the written submission, was almost suggesting we could have this approach where we're encouraging everyone to come forward in the knowledge that um, 
if they do so, it isn't a criminal offence per se, just to, to have a restriction order. The, um, but if it's breached, it will be. And at the same time, deal with those who are already in a forced marriage, where it's been proved they're already in it, to make that a criminal offence. Could you comment on, on looking at it from that perspective? Is there any problem with that? It seems to me we're balancing the two things then. Not, not if someone's you know, already being coerced, they aren't in the forced marriage, you're doing everything to prevent, and that's where the breach of the orders and, and making a civil offence works very well. But if they're already there, as things stand in Scotland, it isn't a criminal offence per se, because we're relying on all the, the things um, Ms Dalrymple Dal talked about uh, for people who are already in a forced marriage. So is there a balancing act to be had there? Can I... Um... Just in terms of statistics, uh, we, we had 14 cases of forced marriage that came to Shakti last year. Um, not everybody was even willing to consider um, the forced marriage civil protection order um, at the stage that they made contact with us. For us, it's a matter of, of work with them to even get them to use that. Um, it does not, that figure does not include women who have already been forced into marriage. But women who have been forced into marriage, who do come forward in our experience so far, what they are looking for is safety for themselves. They are not necessarily looking for uh, some sort of uh, justice. They are not looking to prosecute their families. What they want is this marriage that they find themselves in to end. Um, their hope, maybe not at that moment, is uh, to reconcile with their families, and that's not advisable at that moment. But in the long term, they do intend and hope, they hold that hope that one day they, their families and them might be able to reconnect. Now, whether that happens for them or not is a matter of time and the families that force them into marriage. Um, so if we criminalize that aspect of, of marriage that has already been forced and women coming forward and saying, I was forced into marriage, then that long-term hope might be significantly diminished. But the reality is that the focus for most of those, even in that situation, coming to an organization like Shakti, Hemet Greif Women's Aid, or any other women's aid, is that they want this marriage to end. Um, it may also be that the, that the man or the woman they are married to um, is not aware that this marriage was forced onto their partner. So do we also want to criminalize someone who isn't actually aware that their partner was forced into marrying them? So all of these questions um, continue to be raised. We could, I think, in theory, still use, um, and that's what the forced marriage civil protection guidelines say, still use uh, the forced marriage protection orders to protect those who've already been forced into marriage as well. Criminalization is not necessarily going to solve the issue for the victims. Um, and I can say quite confidently, of the 14 cases that have come to Shakti in 2012-2013, um, all the adults, were not willing to use any legal recourse, even civil protection, um, at that stage. So, so criminalization, um, will they even come forward if we criminalize? But they were willing to speak to the police as long as the police were able to guarantee their safety, and that's the response that has worked, where their safety at that moment has been protected and the police have worked. No one has gone and challenged and prosecuted their families. But putting that safety in place, what that has done for victims is, is that if something that they feel is complete, that it is completely unacceptable to them occurs, they will come forward. But an immediate response that we are going to go after your parents or a lot more people than your parents will, will not make them talk. That's very helpful, thank you. Yes. Um, Demdi, I'll switch up. I think I'll bring Sandra and John, if I may, because you were both involved in the legislation, I take it. <laughs> were you involved in the legislation as well? No, well, you were involved in the legislation from Equal Ox, weren't you? Yes. So I'm interested to hear, because you were all informative, all the stuff mm -hmm. that took you to the 
civil, the original civil um, remedy, followed by if it's a breach, it's a criminal. I think we should make plain, because somebody said to me, surely it's illegal anyway, and I suggest it's illegal, but it's not a criminal offence mm -hmm. at the moment, unless you breach the order. So it is illegal, of course, yeah. Manny, just to make plain on the record that we're not saying, you know, it's not illegal. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair, and, and uh, good afternoon, isn't it, actually? Uh, thanks very much for, for coming along. Yeah, having been involved in the, the original legislation through the Equal Opportunities Committee, we did take evidence from all of the groups, and um, the evidence we, we took was similar to the self model that basically it's not as clear-cut as it seems. There is a lot of you know, cultural issues there and historical issues also. Uh, and one of the questions that, which we asked then and I would ask again now is the fact that people who are perhaps even brought over for forced marriage, and it's not just women, there's men involved as, as well in, in this particular aspect, uh, find it very, very difficult to break up a family, as you might say. And I think that's where it lies. And we thought that at the time to criminalise it would make it even more difficult for people, as you have quite rightly said then, to, to bring it to the fore. Because a number of particularly younger people who were, who were brought over under a forced marriage even, that is the only network that they have. So they're very much alone. I think uh, you're giving evidence. We'll get to a question. They're very much alone, and I think that's why, you know, when you looked at the criminalisation of it um, those, those years ago, it seemed um, it wasn't the proper way to go. But obviously this LCM is going through Westminster at the moment, and we only have a short time scale in which to put forward our uh, views on, on the committee. Uh, and obviously I've, I've read the submissions and yourselves and Lily as well, uh, want to, you know, basically be consulted and basically saying that you've not been consulted. To, to ask a couple of questions then, if you were to be consulted, how long would that take? Bear in mind, we have a short time scale to, to bring back our, our decisions on it. And also the fact that the, the history of, of the issues, which you quite rightly say you, you deal with it day in, day out, have you mentioned it to any of the people within Shakti's Women's Aid or Greif Women's Aid, their thoughts on this criminalisation of this bill? Yes, um, we have spoken, obviously, to our staff, but also to a number of those who have been affected mm -hmm. uh, by forced marriage. Um, and one in particular stands out. This is a, a woman who is very estranged from her family, um, has a, some relationship with them. Her forced marriage took place maybe about 15, 18 years ago. And it's only now that she's coming forward bravely to talk about forced marriage. And even her, um, who did go and ask for safety um, at the time when she was still um, a teenager um, and didn't actually get the most effective response, which is still true for a number of victims of forced marriage today, um, even her, uh, she is not convinced that criminalization will assist victims um, as it is happening. Maybe retrospectively, 10, 15 years on, when you're, when you're moved away from the situation, um, you may want it. You may have thought that I should have done that. But, but that's really a, a, a real minority of, of those who've affected by, by forced marriage saying that I would have wanted my, my parents or my, my uncle or my aunt or my uh, husband to go to prison. So, um, you, know, it's, it's not a, you know, it's not an in-depth consultation, but we, I did speak to a number of uh, women and, of course, our colleagues as well. Thank you. Um, just to um, address the point around wh how long a consultation, I think it's a bit academic, Sandra. Our mm. concern um, in the submission that we um, put in is that the step taken by the Scottish Government was taken without any discussion with the Forced Marriage Network, without any consultation with the organisations that it had consulted quite extensively with in the run-up to the 2011 Act, as you'll know from your work on mm -hmm. the um, Equal Ops Committee. Um, and that was a good process that took account of the views of different communities around Scotland and looked at um, what was going to work. If I could draw a parallel with... Um, Sure. I mean, I'm just c correct, uh, c confirmed. The government hasn't taken a step yet. I mean, they've right. put, they've put forward what we have is, um, it's come to this committee, and I'm just looking at the time scale. If this is helpful, mm -hmm. that we've got to report by mid-December, and in the first week back there'd be a debate. Now, uh, this committee is very influential, uh, so maybe if we take a view on this, we can uh, turn uh, turn the tide a bit. And it's provisionally being dealt with at Westminster mid-January. I take that provisionally. There's not really 
nothing, nothing set down in stone yet, but certainly don't think that it's all done and dusted. Right. Well, we wouldn't it's, have you here if we thought that. Yeah, um, I thank you for that, Madam Convener, but I would say in response to it that it's now at this committee, but it started out as an email to the Forced Marriage Network announcing that there was going to be um, a criminalisation of forced marriage. But when this so, committee saw that, yeah, it decided to have you here, it's we jumped great. in. Right. Very happy that you did that. Um, so, and it's good to know that it isn't done and dusted. I would draw, uh, I'd like to draw a quick parallel with um, the work that has been done on domestic abuse in Scotland over the last three decades. In 1981, um, the then Scottish office um, progressed a piece of work which led to the Matrimonial Home Scotland Act, which many of you will be familiar with. That was an act that was effectively a civil response, a civil remedy response to domestic abuse at a time when very few cases of domestic abuse made it to the police and even fewer made it past the police to the Procurator Fiscal Service. It was recognised that something needed to be done to protect people who were victims of domestic abuse and in particular to ensure that they didn't lose their home as a result of being a victim and that's where the Matt Holmes Act came from. Over the subsequent, however many years it is now, 32 I think, <laughs> yeah, over that three decades plus what we have done is seen an enormous shift in public perceptions about domestic abuse, in recognition of the impact it has, the education and awareness raising that has gone on has massively supported women and men to come forward and acknowledge that they are victims of domestic abuse. And where in 1976 the Dobashes were able to review, I think, 2,000 cases um, where there had been an assault against a wife by a husband for their Violence Against Wives report. Um, last year we saw over 60,000 incidents reported to the police in Scotland. Now, for me, there is a parallel here. Forced marriage is an issue that is not talked about in the communities it affects. It is not well known about by the agencies and practitioners. And, and having a civil remedy enables that process of education and awareness raising to take place alongside making sure that protection is available for those who are um, at risk of being forced into marriage. It is a lot of different behaviours, it's a lot of patterns of behaviour. Where there's a criminal act that can be identified, there is law in Scotland that already allows it. So, just to... Does anybody else wish to comment? What about the police? Because you've got a different view about this, and uh, what we seem to be hearing is this is, would be counterproductive to protecting the very people we want to protect and that what you're just saying is this could be incremental and somewhere down the road it might be possible to move on to it being criminal offence but not this way, not now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I accept it is hugely complex and I'm very aware of the, the strong views certainly about the what uh, until today had been felt to be a, a, a lack of consultation <coughs> and that was expressed at a meeting just at the end of October where um, Police Scotland had uh, stakeholders all together from service providers, particularly third sector, um, your organisations both represented. And this was really about the wider, not just forced marriage, but female genital mutilation and so-called honour-based violence, because it is very much accepted um, by Police Scotland that we don't fully understand all of the um, uh, issues surrounding it and all of the consequences of what we think is a good intervention that might actually have unwitting consequences. So um, there's no uh, departure from that here. I'm still, uh, and I think that Crown uh, also acknowledging that, that we very much, there is an evolution here and we do need to understand the stance, really, if we were being invited to express an opinion, do we think that forced marriage should be criminalised, should it not? Um, our response is that we think it should because of the clarity of message as much to the communities as to um, our own teams and how we actually recognise and deal with what is a problem. And I don't think that it's, it's sensitive. I don't think we should be distracted by um, considerations of um, a diversity, uh, which we've had cultural sensitivities in the arena of FGM, for instance, to take us away from what we know to be right. And this is uh, that no one should be forced into a marriage. 
we, we, sorry, we are taking that message out anyway through the Civil Protection um, Act because after the act there was uh, a significant public campaign around the issue of forced marriage and that it is not acceptable. And, and I think to some extent that, it, I don't know if any research has been done on the effectiveness of that, but certainly from our perspective it's an easier conversation to have with a lot of people that we were not having before. So for example that includes uh, local authorities who until this legislation were not even willing to uh, talk about forced marriage or recognize it as an issue for them. So um, the civil legislation has sent that message out quite effectively to a lot of people that it is not acceptable, both within service providers who until recently were not asking questions, were not doing anything about it, but also within communities where it is being said that, that forced marriages are illegal you know, that they are not recognized in law, as we've already clarified. Uh, but um, do we need to criminalize it to make that message stronger? I'm not quite sure. I think if we say that it is not acceptable and we provide effective responses to victims who are coming forward once they get that message, um, we still have to do a lot more work about getting that message to them because a lot of the people who are supposed to understand this message haven't yet. There is still, there is still confusion between the difference between a forced marriage and an arranged marriage, yes. and that is not amongst victims, but actually amongst those who are supposed to protect them. So by uh, do we need to criminalize it to make that, that discussion stronger? I'm not quite sure because we're already trying to do that. Where we need to focus on is investing in helping those who are taking Taking that message forward, organizations like Shakti Women's Aid and Hemet Greif Women's Aid and our, our partners, sister organizations within Women's Aid and others, uh, to, to, to have the resources and also to have the resources to protect victims. Because what is happening is that when victims leave, while the police might um, provide the most accurate response, what we find is that in terms of practical long-term responses that will allow victims to lead a life that is safe and, and happy um, is not necessarily there. And that's where really we should be having our discussion. Can I let somebody else come in now? Is that all right? Uh, I've got uh, John Finney, Alison Broderick, and then Margaret. Thank you, Convener. Uh, afternoon, panel. Uh, it's a question for the Detective Chief Superintendent and the submission from Police Scotland. Clearly, there's a lot of collaborative work goes on yourselves with the prosecution and with the Women's Aids Group. Did you discuss the submission you were going to put with the women's age groups before submitting it at all? No. That's well, not indicative of collaborative working in that case then, is it? Well, we, uh, we had a meeting on the 30th of October where, as I say, everybody was represented and indeed I uh, was chairing that meeting and I gave a platform to one of uh, Lily's colleagues, uh, Louise, in order to... Um, to explain to everybody present the issues. So there's no question that, um, that I was aware of the issue. I was aware of the government's position that I gave an opportunity for that to be aired within that partnership context. Um, if you asked me specifically, did I discuss the content? No, I didn't, um, but I knew, we, we, we knew what one another's position would be. And, and I would have to say um, the same as the Crown, that clearly I'm being an, uh, Police Scotland is being asked for a view, so it's giving one, but we'll enforce whatever the law is. So it's not to be fair for anybody, for frankly, to to do much. <laughs> There's no personal attacks here. No, I know, no, no, but I think in fairness, I'm, yes, it's yes, all I'm, been I'm trying, I'm trying yeah. to understand process because the, it seems to me there's a very clear message and the, the information that was emailed last night I found very compelling and that is if we don't take advice from the people for whom the legislation is intended to affect or the communities, then I, I think we ignore the, the message from there at our peril. And so it is the view of Police Scotland that specific legislation on top of what already is there in the terms of abduction, breach of the peace, false imprisonment, trafficking, and all, that, that that would change community attitudes? Well, I wouldn't go so far as to, uh, I wouldn't be so bold as to say that a May change help to change the law attitudes would, in, amongst practicing communities. I, I think there are precedents for that, and I think that, that um, this Parliament has done that with um, football offences, for instance, giving a very strong message to people about sectarianism. If we're drawing parallels, 
you know, there was existing legislation and is existing legislation to deal with all of those matters, and yet it was felt to be an issue, societal and a moral issue in Scotland that we wanted to articulate very strongly that this is not acceptable. That's the vein that I would argue it would make it, it would, there would be merit in being very specific and very clear that forced marriage is a crime in Scotland. But having said that, I wouldn't for one moment uh, dismiss uh, the view of uh, service providers and people within the community whose understanding is far more sophisticated than mine is. Um, and that's why I referred to the meeting that I tried to hear all of those voices and give uh, an opportunity for people to discuss that. Um, and as the convener says, there, there really wasn't, it was less than a week, I think, we had in order to provide a submission. Indeed, I understand the quick turnaround. I, I wonder if Mr... Can I just add, John, I think in fairness to the additional, uh, the, again, but not fault because of the, the breakneck mm -hmm. speed of this, the submission by Malcolm Graham, Assistant Chief Counsel, 20 November, caveats lots of things that you've said about the existing legislation uh, not been around very long and also the fact that it's how hugely unreported. So I appreciate your position is difficult uh, and that we, we have this in this, the um, additional uh, submission you've made. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. For Mr Rimple, please. I, I just wonder, given what you've heard, and I absolutely appreciate that the police and the Crown Office Property and Fiscal Service will work with the legislation they're given, but has it been your view that the civil remedies combined with the existing common law has been insufficient to deal with an issue. We, um, that is the difficulty. We haven't um, the experience in relation to the civil remedies. Um, I think there is evidence that there have been um, a number of um, FMPO orders. We have had one breach of order reported to us, um, and actually it was decided in consultation with the police after a result of, of that report um, that we wouldn't progress a prosecution because actually um, there were difficulties, I think, with, with the way the, the order was actually drafted, and actually that wasn't the response that was demanded at that time. So I don't have the experience, um, and my organisation doesn't have the experience, which is why we will rely very heavily on um, all our support agencies um, to help us with the education and, and the training process for what will be a very specialised area of work if, if a criminal offence is created. Well, well, clarify, me. you said it's not being progressed. The, there, there was one report, no, and my but understanding... In the submission yes, from Malcolm Graham, it says, to date, only one has been breached with the case subject to live criminal proceedings. My understanding is that that, that decision has been taken, that there will not yeah. be live criminal proceedings. Thank you. Just to clarify, because that's what's in this. Right. Well, likewise, I'm new to this and just getting it from the papers we've had in the, the last few, few, few days, but that would suggest that perhaps the existing arrangements are working satisfactorily, would it not? Um, I think the point that I made before is that it, it could be difficult to shoehorn some of um, the behaviours within a forced marriage into the existing offences. Um, but I, I don't have examples that I can provide this committee um, because simply um, they haven't been reported to us. Thank you. Um, well, I would hesitate to say that it's sufficient because uh, I think seven's a woefully low number um, for, you know, we've heard Shakti talk about 14, not including women who are already in that position. Uh, so clearly, somewhere the information isn't coming to the police. And I understand uh, what inhibitors there might be for that, but, but somewhere collectively, um, we are failing a lot of women and children. But, but what you've been told by the people directly involved is that involving the criminal law will act as a further inhibition to people coming forward. Yes. But nonetheless, you okay. commend it. Well, so we, we don't know about hardly any at the moment, and we'll know about none. I, I wouldn't say that, um, that, that the women are being failed um, because they haven't gone to the police. I think... Um, they, they have made contact because messages about the intolerance of forced marriage have reached them and they are asking for assistance at that moment in time involving the police is not the sort of assistance they wish for. Sometimes it's just a discussion of their options and maybe somewhere along the line we may have to involve the police. And, and I am speaking mainly of, of adult women with full
full capacity. Where there are children and adults with incapacity, um, it, it requires a completely different response, and we already have uh, uh, processes in place for that. It's not uniform, but I can tell you from experience, uh, to get those processes in place and to get people to take it seriously uh, sometimes can be a struggle because they don't necessarily understand the issue of, of forced marriage itself. Men report if they've been forced into marriage. Yes, I noticed my colleague Sandra says it can be sometimes one party, sometimes both parties can be involved. In Who do they report? Do they have any network support or? Well, um, I, I'm not asking. I'm really well, asking. Um, asking I, I, I think there are a number of other places um, that they could go to. Um, the forced marriage unit is, is one a good destination, the police. Um, um, I have been involved in supporting an, an agency where a man had uh, experienced forced marriage, but that agency was not dealing with forced marriage as such, but we linked that agency with the right services that were needed for that situation. Mm -hmm. So uh, the only thing that there is for women are women's aid, but I, I suppose every other service uh, um, should be able to deal with the forced marriage disclosure. Um, most of the disclosures, if they are children, might be within education, and if they are adults with incapacity, then it might be a third, uh, a voluntary sector organization or, or the local authority. So I don't see much difference uh, between the two, and I think that statutory responses would be the same for men um, anyway. The I mean, part issues. of the part of the thing with this committee and take the evidence is that people who are interested in this, who may indeed be in a forced marriage, will be able to read and hear what you say mm -hmm. and may never have thought of reporting it. So it, apart from looking at the LCM, it may in itself publicise yes. and take some people forward. That's why I wanted to ask about men as well who may yes. feel it, it may be different for them to come forward or whatever, you know, how, how they would find it. And, you have the opportunity to sort of say what can and, be done. And we work with young boys or, and men up to the age of 18 anyway. Um, so if they fall under that, uh, cap, that age group, then uh, women's aid, Shakti women's aid anyway, would be working That's with That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, yes, John? Thank you very much. Alison, followed by Roderick. Thank you. I beg your pardon, Katrina Dalrymple, you want to come in. Sorry, Ms. Sorry, very, uh, much appreciated, convener. I, I just wanted to build on something that, that um, Lily said in relation to the evolution of, of domestic abuse. And I do wonder whether the committee may wish to consider the, the cultural change that is required in, in Scotland in relation to the issue of, of forced marriage. Um, and I think um, Gillian here identified that criminalising conduct can play a part in influencing cultural change. Um, it's not the whole story and it, it may be a very small part of the story um, but I do think that there has to be some benefit in, in clarifying what in Scotland is unacceptable and, and criminal conduct to make it clear for people. Um, not just the people themselves that are, are, are subject of that but the people surrounding them the, the, the schools, the education system, the social workers, making it very very clear to everybody that that, that, that is um, potentially criminal. Um, and I think that that does have a part in, in changing attitudes about what is acceptable. And I think we saw in relation to the stalking legislation that by calling it a name and actually taking it and, and giving it a unique name, then we have made inroads in relation to victims of stalking coming forward and actually telling us what has been happening to them. And I just wanted to make the committee aware of that, if, if that would be I, I think we can take it as a general point, but it's not one size fits all. Okay, I want to, right. no, I I want to uh, take... Uh, John, can I move on? Uh, uh, move yes, on? thank you very much. Alison, followed by Roderick, please. Thank you, convener. It maybe follows on, on from Mr Dalrymple's point. Uh, the government, Scottish Government is arguing that they um, feel the need for consistent legislation on this across the UK, and that's why they've brought forward the LCM. Now, set aside the fact that that's a rather odd statement from a nationalist government. Are there <laughs> any... Are there any unintended consequences of not agreeing to the LCM um, in that circumstance? Would, would there be dangers that it would be perceived as less of an issue in Scotland then if, if we don't proceed with the, the LCM? Now that we are where we are. Yes, Ms. Green. Scotland doesn't have a specific offence of marital rape. 
it's an offence to rape the person you're married to or to rape a woman you're in an intimate relationship with. And now under the most recent Sexual Offences Act, it would be an offence to rape a man that you were married to or in a civil partnership with. But Scotland does not have a specific offence of marital rape. England does. There is statute, there has to be, there has to be statute in England because that is the way their law works. It's not the way our law works. So. That's one part of an answer, yes. And, uh, <laughs> no, it's a fair point. Just the first thing that occurred to me. Yes. Anybody else wish to comment? Do we have to, what about enforcement? What about cross-border? How would that, you know, if you had... We already have difficulty, I mean, we have difficulty with cross-border enforcement. We have it around things like interdicts. We have different civil remedies in mm. Scotland from the civil remedies that are available in England. There might be parallels and there might be ways to equalise them. Um, until relatively recently, and I'm not sure that it's actually gone all the way through, you couldn't, you couldn't register to vote anonymously in Scotland as a survivor of domestic abuse using your inter interdict as the evidence for the um, electoral registration clerk that you had in fact got a reason to need to vote um, anonymously. Um, you did in England and Wales. And if you came from Northern Ireland, England or Wales to Scotland, you could pitch up at an electoral registration officer and say, here's my injunction. You've got paperwork that tells you you recognise that. And they could get registered to vote anonymously in Scotland, but not a woman from Scotland. So we've already got cross-border issues. We find ways around them. You know, like they're there. We work on them. It's a large part of what organisations like mine do. <laughs> so it, you know, I don't see it as being an issue in itself. Simidi? Getting back to the question, I think um, forced marriage uh, being a crime in England and Wales and not being a crime in Scotland then feeds a perception. I think that is a risk that there's a perception that um, that Scotland is in some way um, has less protection. And I accept that might not be the reality, but that might be the perception. So that, that would be my answer. Thank you. Interesting question. Uh, Rod, not that your questions aren't always interesting, <laughs> Alison, I know it just sounded like that as if I was surprised. Roderick, followed by Margaret. Yeah, I, I want to follow up from what Alison has been saying in a slightly different way. It seems to me that uh, um, the UK government is a signature to the Istanbul Convention, and given the current constitutional position, the UK government speaks for Scotland in terms of having signed that convention. Scotland has a different criminal system, but we still have, therefore, the key question in my mind is, does, do exist, does existing legislation in Scotland meet the requirements of Article 37? The Scottish Government says there is no specific crime in Scotland forcing someone to marry or taking advantage of their lack of understanding to trick them into taking part in a marriage. That seems to me the crucial point, and whether or not it does or it doesn't. So whether or not you are in favour or against criminalising it, that point is slightly relevant to the basic point. So whether or not we have different we pr prosecute in different ways or have different criminal offences is by the way. Ms. Any Henry. comments on that? I, th I think um, when I saw clarity um, from officials, certainly within the government following the, the um, spirited discussion that I referred to earlier, uh, that, that was very much the, the response was that, that, that it's kind of a moot point whether you agree or you don't agree. It is a fact that we are not compliant with Article 34 um, at the moment that forced marriage is not a crime in Scotland. So, hence, that was the response about the, the uh, lack of consultation because there was really no requirement for consultation because that is, that is a fact. Right. Yes, because I think I read somewhere, some years to comment, yes, I think I read somewhere we were compliant. Mm. Yeah. No. Yes, Ms. Green. Yes. Yeah. So there's a. Yes. Our argument is that the, the, it's about interpretation. The, yes. set, Article yeah. 37 requires that parties take the necessary legislative or other measures to ensure that the intentional conduct of forcing an adult or a child to enter into a marriage is criminalised. And, I, and our argument is that there is legislation and there is common law in Scotland that, that means that all of the behaviours, and as Myrtle has said earlier in, in her sort of presentation, we're not talking about a wedding. We're talking about a process of behaviour, a process of grooming that goes on from when people are really very young. And so the range of behaviours and the patterns of behaviour involved in that you know, there, there are points in that where you can say, yeah, that's an offence, that's an offence. But actually, um, you know, I would say that we've got legislation and we've, or we've got law, common law, that, that 
meets the requirements of Article 37. It's designed to address the deficit in states that do not criminalise domestic abuse. If I can just say that as someone who was involved in the, the debates around the development of the Convention. That's the requirement of Article no, 37. Well, I, I agree to extend. I think that's where the debate should be. And a lot of the other points we're considering seem to me slightly irrelevant to, to where we are. So, yeah. I'd obviously be interested to hear further from the Scottish Government on, on that point. Thank you. And we're irrelevant with the other questions, but I don't mind. Um, Margaret. Yeah, that was my starting point too, and I think there's some dubiety about whether it does contravene Section 37. And then we're into arguments about deterrent and cultural change. But I think we've heard this morning, uh, this afternoon now, um, that we're not going to get people coming forward if it's criminalised, um, per se, as forced marriage. Uh, where's, where's the public interest in this? It's not going to be a deterrent because um, the one thing that the victims want is some protection to get out of the marriage and they still harbour the, the hope that they can be integrated into the family again. Much less chance of that if it's then become a criminal offence. Um, I notice in the Women's Aid submission there's a, a suggestion that if the um, if MPOs, the um, protection orders are breached and criminal proceedings are started, it should then be looked at as an aggravated offence. And that may well um, send out the deterrent and cultural messages that, that people are looking for. But can I just put on record, you know, I was convener of Equal Opportunity. Sandra and I sat through all this and you evidence. Sometimes and the way you sweep me to the side at times, yes. And we we listened to all the arguments. It was a very complex um, issue. And we were very proud of the legislation that we brought out. We thought we'd excelled um, what was in place in, in England and come up with a balance where it was going to be a deterrent, but yes, encourage people to come forward, give the protections. And I really feel in the, the government has jumped the gun in seeking to obtain a, an amendment on the 15th of October without scrutinising how the orders are um, working in, in in practice just now. So thank you all very much for the evidence. Good. <laughs> <laughs> good. No, but this is a good starting point. You good don't have to by a for bucket. picking this up. <laughs> because we are in majority government now and things can go through very fast. And this is a case in point. And in particularly on the forced marriage affecting males, we're looking at equal marriage. Um, I think my submission was this, if, if we're looking at um, legislation to um, see how heterosexual, uh, how homosexual um, males in sometimes the Asian community are forced into heterosexual marriages, then it would have my full support, because that is discrimination and abuse still going on. That hasn't even been looked at. So there's a lot to uncover it's not here. not I was laughing at, Margaret. Thanking everybody for their evidence, which is usually the role of the convener. <laughs> well, but I've given up. Uh, can I just say, I think, I, think, uh, I think the committee would agree. There's no, there were two points, I think. You're quite right, Roddy. We have to look at, first of all, is it mandatory this is done to comply with Article 37? You know, is it really? That's the first legal test. If that is the legal test and that legal test has to be met, then there are issues about the practicalities. If it's not the legal test that has to be complied with, it makes it much easier for us because, you know, I think we've listened very carefully to the, the result of practical consequences. But that's the first important test. It's quite good to have an advocate on the team uh, at times, useful. Can I thank you very much for your evidence? I thank you for your patience in, in waiting such a long time uh, to give your evidence. And I'm just going to let you go and get warmed up um, and we'll move on to the next item. <laughs> so I'm going to straight on <laughs> to item three, subordinate legislation, consideration of three negative instruments. Come on, committee, time presses. We agree to defer the first is the title condition of Scotland Act 2003 Conservation Bodies Amendment Order 2013 SSI 2013 oblique 289. It adds one body, the Perth and Kinross Heritage Trust, I hope this isn't controversial, to the list of prescribed conservation bodies. The delegated powers and law reform committee is content with the instrument. Do members have any comments in relation to that instrument? Thank you very much, Roddy. Um, and are you content to make no recommendations in relation to that instrument? 
The second instrument is the Act of Sedern Commissary Business, SSI 2013, oblique 291. It removes those sheriff courts which are closing from the list of places where commissary business can be conducted. The DPLR committee is content with the instrument. Do members have any comments in relation to that SSI? Not content with the closures, but... Well, I know, but it's not talking about those now. It's a technical thing now. So are you content to make no recommendation? Thank you. The third is the Drugs Court Scotland Amendment Order 2013, SSI 2013, of 302. The instrument removes the requirement for there to be a dedicated drugs court in the Sheriff of Tayside Central and 5. The DPLR committee is content with the instrument. Last week, a query was raised in condition in relation, I beg your pardon, to the impact assessment uh, on this instrument, which Scottish Government officials have responded to. That response can be found at paragraph 21 of page 4 of paper 3. Any Comments. Convener. I've got two. I knew I would get comments. It's all right. I was alert to Alison, followed by uh, Margaret. Uh, I think it's a backward step. I think the Drugs Court in Fife has been um, a successful um, process, and I know that there is local opposition to the closure of this Drugs Court, and uh, I would resist this. Okay. Yes, I have concerns about this, Convener. There was no impact assessment carried out. The Sheriff Principal, as is his duty, has said that um, it would be good to close the Grad Court because of capacity. And my question is, mm. has capacity issues arisen because the Drug Court sits in Dunfermline and Kirkcaldy Sheriff Court, and at present um, there isn't enough capacity because of the planned closure of the nearby Cooper and JP share of court. So it seems to me it's for all the wrong reasons. This was 2002, a pilot, no impact on recently and how this has worked. Uh, but there will be savings. I would submit that these are false economies. And like Alison, I would oppose the, the closure. I have to say that I'm, I, and I'm hugely with supportive of drugs court, but I think I've read, it's not the papers read today, that in fact there's a high degree of recidivism uh, in those courts and that 70 to 80 percent of those who taken part were back and it didn't work. I'm sad to report, I'm quite sad to say that, but that in those specific, separate from uh, the, the issues, that that particular one had not been uh, for a whole host, and I've been at drugs courts, and it's very complex for the sheriff and support teams had not been successful in the way one would have hoped. Roddy? It's a record. I, I disagree. I don't think Margaret has any evidence. Or I'm not saying she's actually saying there is evidence that this has got anything to do with the closure of the sheriff court in Cooper. Uh, I think it's a wee bit unhelpful, I have to say, that... Uh, we get a response back which says the sheriff principal he no longer says he no longer wanted a drug court to run in his sheriffdom doesn't actually say why um, so it's well, left, left things a bit more confused than they might otherwise I, I have don't been. want to publicise the yeah. Herald newspaper I've done it but I think in response the government response to it gave the percentage of yeah. recidivism in terms of drugs uh, well, which sad to say was very high I thought for, for a, you know, a dedicated court yes well, the rationale for having a dedicated court was to deal with that very specific and extremely complex issue that. of which recidivism and um, you know, regressing into to, um, offending behaviour connected with um, uh, addiction issues is, is, has to be a recognised part. So I too am paying to any closure of such a specialist court. Well, I want to move quickly because, yes... I don't know if Roddy had already said it, but perhaps I will reiterate it. It's similar to that. Anyway, it says the Sheriff Principal believes he would be better able to discharge his statutory responsibility if we move away from a dedicated drugs court. And it's not possible to continue a drugs court without the support of the right. Sheriff Principal. We've all had our little say. We've had our say on it. No, I, I, well, yes, uh huh. Um, it says the Sheriff Principal believes that for a number of reasons, issues um, including court capacity. There is no longer a strong case. For okay, opinion. that's all on the record, including my bit about. And it sent, when I said recidivism, I meant recidivism back into drugs, not not into crime per se, but you know, being unable. I have to say, I saw the Glasgow one. I was very impressed years ago when I saw it. But that may be part. I do wish to move. I, okay, Alison. Just say we don't. The rest of the committee I don't have those figures to to, to, well, to analyse, and I do know that the, the CH. CHP, uh, no, the Community Justice Authority had concerns about this, okay. and the local council has concerns. I said, I read it, I think, in the Herald. I've, I have put a caveat around it. something like 60 to 70 per cent back in drugs. And so you can check it out and hold me to account next week if I've um, misquoted. Uh, um, in terms of having said all that, nevertheless, are members uh, content? There's no comments 
uh, into the conclusions reached. You content to endorse the conclusions reached by the DPLR subject to, oh, I beg your pardon. Are you content to make no recommendation in relation to this instrument? Not content. Not content. It has to be reported by the 2nd of December, so we can do a quick report, which you can all see before it goes out. It, no, no, there's no, no, it's not a voting uh, item. It's, it, it, you're reporting back to the, the um, Subordinate Legislation Committee. It's, I know it's not the name anymore. Um, and so we have members who are not content yeah. and others who are, and we'll just do a brief report. But everything you've said is on the record. And some statistics, if they're available, would be very helpful. Yes. The trouble is, in the deadline, they might not be able to get it. We will endeavour to get some statistics for you, particularly my reference that I've made, if you check that out for me, please, so I don't want to be maligned. Um, <laughs> but we'll put a short one in, and know that there are votes in that. Item four, um, Act of Student Rules of the Court Session Amendment uh, number six, miscellaneous, 2013, SSI, 2013, oblique 294. The instrument is not subject to any parliamentary procedure. It is before us because the DPLR committee reported it for an incorrect reference to another instrument and responding to the point the Lord President's private office has confirmed that plans to correct there at the first available opportunity. Do members have any comments in relation to that statutory instrument? Um, are members content to endorse the conclusions reached in the DPLR by the B DPLR? Yep. Is that a yes? I hear a yes. Yes. Right. Um, now, what's this? What's this? Okay. Uh, item five, Offensive Behaviour at Football and Threatening Communications Act. We return to consideration of this. Um, you'll recall that we invited responses from the Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs, the Chief Counsel and the Lord Advocate, in relation to the issues raised in correspondence to members regarding the operation of the Act. These responses are included in your papers, paper six, along with a further response from fans against criminalisation. Can I just give you a wee uh, warning about some judice members not to refer to any specific cases in case they are live, but reference can be made to general issues arising from the Act. As you know, calls are made in the correspondence received for an early review of the legislation. The Act is due to be reviewed for the period 1st of August 2012 to 1st August 2014, with a report to be re of the review to be laid before Parliament by 1st of August 2015. We are therefore invited to consider whether, in light of all the correspondence response received, we consider that action needs to be taken at this stage. In doing so, we need to bear in mind that any issues of police misconduct should be referred to the police complaints procedure. Also, the re issue referring to domestic violence is not directly related to the operation of the Act. Do members have any comments on the correspondence received? Margaret. Yeah. John. It seems to me the responses from the Minister of Police Scotland and the Crown don't actually seem to address whether the um, Act is working in practice better than the previous legislation. I think that's the whole nub of the, the problem. So for me, we are no further forward. John? Uh, well, I, I would dissent strongly from what Margaret said there. Uh, I've said all along I support the legislation. Uh, and. Um, <laughs> But I was keen that we address the concerns that were raised with us. And uh, I think given this healthy bundle of papers, about two inches deep, um, I think we have a lot of information, which is in the public domain, um, uh, the clerks are, are, are confirming there. Um, for me, the principal uh, issue w was about the perception of a disproportionate impact. And from the statistics we have, that isn't borne out. Um, um, and uh, with regard to, if we go back to the historic position, which I, I hope is still a live offer, that was awareness raising of the legislation, which I think is key. In, in, in this legislation, we've been told about engagement with fans groups um, and guidance, indeed, on specific um, uh, emerging trends and, 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 indeed, songs, I think, are referred to. Um, it, I find it disappointing because all along I, I, I want people to engage. I, want, I would, would encourage that. The information that we have that in relation, and it's probably best I quote, FOCUS, which is the um, Football Coordination Unit for Scotland, 
hosted a number of events around the country for supporters in the period immediately prior to the Act's implementation in 2012. Um, and this, they say, provided an opportunity to discuss the bill and address supporters' concerns. A key theme was to reassure supporters that police tactics would not significantly change once the legislation came into force. Focus continues to engage on a daily basis with elected members, supporters' groups, fan liaison and individual members of the public to answer queries and provide education on the operation of the legislation. And th this is the bit that, that I find most disappointing, Kavina, the, the final sentence of that paragraph, which says, in many cases, however, those most vociferously opposed the Act have repeatedly declined to meet focus officers. And I think we need engagement. We need people to be speaking to understand that. So that's with the, the two issues of awareness of the legislation and disproportionality. Um, I was reassured in relation to, and I raised the question of camera surveillance, and clearly from the, these documents, again, we're told about hand-held and body-worn worn cameras. And please, if you bear with me, I'll find the particular reference um, in relation to that, which was, and again quoting from Police Scotland, the officers deploy, excuse me, the officers deployed as evidence gathering teams equipped with body worn video and handheld cameras undertake a training course which includes information on police powers. Well, that's very reassuring for a start. But I think the significantly human rights and data protection, and they are expected to provide members of the public with this information if asked to do so. Um, clearly, we want um, the police to use technology to um, acquire evidence in ways that are both data protection and human rights legislation compatible. And um, again, back to the avenues of redress and conscious of your comment about live cases. Um, at previous occasions I've, uh, and representations we've had made to the committee, I've encouraged cooperation. I've encouraged fans to come forward and if there's any suggestion of wrongdoing from whatever quarter to raise that. Again, I would encourage that to be the case. Sadly, that doesn't seem to have been the case. And it's perhaps unfortunate that we are fettered in what we can say in relation uh, to, to one specific uh, location and events there. Um, I think we've also received some very specific information from the Lord Advocate. Um, and I don't know if protocol would permit me reading out some of the information that's in there. Public domain, that's the letter of Lord Advocate. Yes, right. of course it is. Well, I'll have to use phrases like F star star star, uh, then um, <laughs> convener. Um, if it's in the public domain, it, merely to say there's a, there's a range of things that people would clearly find um, uh, offensive, and I hope all reasonable fans would condemn. And that's uh, successful, successful prosecutions have followed arrest for brandishing a flagpole to make it look like a firearm during a football match making a Nazi salute at a football match, engaged in organised and pre-arranged disorder and violence at a busy station. And if people have seen the footage of the women and children fleeing uh, at, a, at a major railway station in Scotland, then that surely uh, would upset people. Uh, abusing passengers, including children, en route to a football match, wearing a T-shirt in sight of opposition fans with the words um, mentioning an organisation, F, and uh, other information on it. Um, Hey John, that he does say appreciate, of course, that this type of behaviour is carried out by a small minority, mm. you know, and, and one doesn't want to tarnish. No, 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 I, I, no I'm not. I'm just saying to conclude the quote, you know. Yes, yes, absolutely, and 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 and, and I think, um, I mean, clearly, I've highlighted many passages and many of the reports here, and could go on at length, but I won't. I think some other things, I'm, I'm reassured, I think both the Minister and the Lord Advocate talk about any suggestion of downplaying the fact that police officers are victims, um, I think is entirely wrong. If someone has got something to, deeply offensive to say about something, um, it shouldn't make any difference whether that individual who receives that abuse is a police officer or not. So the fact that 13.1% of the charges relate to um, police the police officers being victim, I, I, I think makes no difference at all. Um, I was very keen that we um, uh, conduct an early review, um, and um, I'm aware of the academic um, review that's ongoing at Stirling University. Um, I, clearly, I'm no academic. There may be other academics in the, the room here. 
The information I have received from all these various sources, which is in the public domain, has reassured me that some of the concerns that um, the um, supporters groups have, have been addressed, and indeed their understandings of positions, and some of the emotive language that's been used, um, has been dispelled. What I would encourage is engagement, um, and engagement with the focus unit. This is, this is part of our role, is to review. I, I feel uh, I'm content to leave things at this, at this time, unless there were significant changes of, of direction in, uh, in policing, in the knowledge that um, this legislation is under very, very tight scrutiny from various quarters, including this committee. But I'm content to leave the proceedings at that at this time. I was still struck, I have to say, that the, the divergence of understanding between Police Scotland, the prosecutors and so on, on, on one side and, and the supporters organisations and the others. So I was tending to favour maybe if we could fit it in a one-off evidence session, we, we could try and get supporters organisations in to have to, to voice their concerns and then go through those with some of the other organisations just to try and, if you like, ensure that um, there is engagement, as, as John Fenny was saying. Sandra White, Lawson. Well, thank, thank, thank you very much, Chair. I haven't got a lot to add because I think John Finney, you know, I concur with everything that John had said, having looking through, having asked for further, you know, update from the Lord Advocate, from the, the Minister uh, et al as well, and basically reading the reports back, particularly in regards to, yeah, there has been police officers who have been on the receiving end. Uh, we have that evidence there. I think uh, we have fulfilled what we were asked to do. I don't think need for any further action to be taken to move it forward. We're looking at that. That was what the actual committee asked for in the first place, was to look at the two full football seasons. We did get what we were asked for in an amendment, and I think we should carry that forward. I don't see the point of uh, bringing forward an ad hoc committee or having an evidence sessions with some football fans. John quite rightly said there is the group who goes round the country, who's open to meet with the fans, and yet we find that a certain number of people are not meeting with them to get any answers you know, back. So I, I would say that uh, basically I wouldn't take any further action at this stage. Yeah, I'm just asking, um, I don't think, I mean, some of this appears to me to be um, complaints about the way police are doing stuff. And that really, it would be quite interesting to know how many complaints have been lodged. I don't know, I've just asked, many complaints have been lodged with the police about the way they're operating the legislation. And I think that would be quite useful to know because, with, you know, that's what we've recommended that where there have been, has been heavy-handed or out of context or whatever we like to call it, that the first port should be lodged a complaint with it and to see it. So I'd quite like us, certainly, to, I don't know if you feel about that. John? Uh, I've got th yeah, th thank you for letting me in here. C can, we, can I say that there's a huge frustration associated with this because it, people need to, quite frankly, put up or shut up. There was a number of serious accusations made and then people would not cooperate with the police to investigate that. Now, I think we need to have a rigorous system of investigating any suggestions of wrongdoing in the police, but that does require people to cooperate. First of all, yes. I I'm think not soliciting complaints about the police. Don't well, I am saying. actually. I mean, if, there, if there's yeah. stuff out there that's going on that is to do with operational policing, then I'm saying, let, let you know, to go to the, bear with me, you know, I'd like to know how many complaints have been lodged with the police um, regarding the operation of the Act, and I think that's useful to know. Sandra, uh, then I'll take you yeah, on. Oh, sorry, you know, I've got... I wasn't, I was, but then I hadn't finished, and then you butted in on I, me. I do that occasionally. But, I get yes, to but. And, and the convener we allow it, absolutely. That's, well, other people That's the role too. of the convener, absolutely. <laughs> but picking up, and, and John's point, because I was going to say this, we had evidence of people within the ones who'd sent us emails who had complained and when the police tried to contact them, they never got back to them. We had people from Cyprus and various other parts of the world, not necessarily local people, and a number of the complaints actually had nothing to do whatsoever with the, this, this bill. It was actually to do with policing <coughs> arrangements. So we've already had notification in previous uh, you know, sessions of people who have complained, but when they've, they've never followed it up. So uh, how do we get people to follow up? I mean, it's not the committee's job. No, no, I, just, I think I've put in the record if there's complaints about the way the, the, the legislation is being operated, distinct from other matters, 
then it would be useful if people did put their complaints to the police uh, with the, the na a narrative of saying what that. had happened. Then we've got some meat. Uh, Alison. I think they know that. Well, you know that I think the legislation was, was ill-judged and, and was rushed through in, a, in an inconsidered way. So um, it does not surprise you that I think we need an early review of it. There is, there is a danger of a breakdown of trust here between um, a group, one particular group of people and, and the police, and that in itself should concern us, I think. And I would support Elaine's suggestion that, at the very least, um, we, we ought to be considering um, an evidence session to take us a bit further. Who, who do we ask? John, it? just bear with sorry, me a minute, sorry. John. No, I think since we last discussed this two weeks ago there, I think the, the goalposts have certainly changed for a couple of the members round about the table. And... Uh, but I think probably, you know, to take it forward, I, I, I agree with the Alice, and I think there is a breakdown of trust here. And uh, I think probably the best way to to recover from that is we should have, you know, even pushed for the early review, or indeed, you know, I would probably, as a last resort, be probably supporting uh, Elaine's, that we should maybe have an early evidence session here. Uh, and whilst we said that, that the, uh, you know, we would like to be consensus, I don't think somewhere down the line we're going to have to take a vote in here and we're going to be discussing this, you know, from now and, and, until the two years is up for the review. <laughs> yeah. I, I think, yeah, the only thing I was going to say about the evidence session, which I can understand it, is um, if it would be to um, make complaints that the police were handling stuff, we're then moving away from what, I mean, I'm just trying to work out what the what the purpose of it would be in terms of the legislation I and mean, if it was if, you know if it's to say the police did x y and z in front of us that would be a matter for the police to deal with not the justice committee whatever the legislation um so just i'm coming i'm coming is uh, just to you know what the purpose would be in terms of the legislation not police operation well, which the is the thing be, the purpose for me would be on the last uh, round of emails that were received i think which uh, some, started, of that, uh, the, the negotiations some of that for, was operational, though, and it involved domestic stuff. abuse, which has nothing but, to do with the legislation, but, but, John. But, but, that's what, but that's what took it here, and that's, that's why even you know members here were calling for an early view on, on the latest okay. stuff. To, OK, so I'll be going to hear somebody else now. now Roderick next, please, because yeah. Roderick's Just very briefly, I don't want to repeat what everybody else has said, but I do think kind of engagement uh, between both sides here would be a very good idea and that irrespective of what decision we take about evidence sessions and also I think there seems to be references to things which certainly should give rise uh, to the possibility of a complaint to the police about the way uh, they, the individuals have been handled and there's no real indication here that anyone's actually used the complaint procedure and if they have these issues then I think they should use the police complaints procedure in, in respect of uh, some of these items. John. This is one uh, of all the items that we've dealt with at this committee. This is one area where um, I, I think we're damned regardless of what we do. I certainly feel that anyway. I act in good faith in everything I did. So John will recall, if John feels I'm someone who's changed my position, what, 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 what was said is that there was going to, you know, I'm, I was keen that we have an early examination. To inform that examination, there was people who wanted to make a decision that day, if you recall. My position was that we be informed by the people best placed to tell us. We have the supporter sides. I suspect not, we don't know how representative that is of all the supporters. And it was to get the information from the prosecutors, eh, the police, and indeed the Scottish Government's <coughs> position. I thought at the beginning, talking about the awareness, the disproportional impact, the cameras, and the specific incident and how that was responded to, that I said that from the information that had come back to us, I felt these issues had been addressed. However, in any case, there is ongoing monitoring. So I've not diluted my position, but I'm not going to ask for information, get it, and then ignore the content. I'm just sitting thinking, would it be, um, I'm trying to find, as somebody says, the middle way, appropriate to hear from the Minister of Community Safety before we get other people in, in relation to... I, I hear you going like that. But I'm trying to find a way for the committee to come to an agreement about something. or um, to See, my concern is, that, is to keep the operational separate from the Act, and that would be difficult yeah. to do. Yeah. Um, and that's the concern, because in terms of parliamentarians, we mustn't start touching on, and it is difficult to separate, we mustn't start talking uh, dealing with operational policing. Yes. 
Yes. Uh, I, I was not there, of course, at, at previous meetings. But when I read all the evidence, something I will agree with John on is we have to be very careful as a committee to give the right message to the supporters out there. They need to engage. We focus. They need to engage. If 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 we if we decide to have evidence or doing anything of the sort, uh, automatically all these people who have not engaged with focus will not engage. And we, and I would prefer uh, instead to send a very strong message and, and, and say to these people, they need to engage with the process. I don't think we're ever going to agree in this committee. I think you should just go to a vote. Well, well, I haven't suggested any, any remedy solutions so far. Glasses on top of my head, now on the end of my Sorry. nose. Right, we could hold... I'm going, to put, I'm going to give you options, so you can add another option. We could hold a one-off evidence session, for example, with the Ministry of Community Safety and Legal Affairs. We could appoint a reporter or a group of reporters to investigate the issues further on our behalf. Or we could explore the options for seeking the establishment of a committee to look at the issue. Or we could take a one-off evidence session. There's the pick and mix at the moment. And if you've got other suggestions, tell me. Yes? My suggestion is we take no further action. Or no further action, right. So I've got no further action. I, I don't know if this is multiple choice. <laughs> no further action. Um, there's no points of order on committees, but I'll let you do it. Well, I'd love to say that. It, it's, it, it, it's, it's just to say... But we, we, we are going to be taking further action because as with everything we're doing, we're monitoring it and we're aware there's a report coming back. So uh, I know what Sandra means, maybe doing nothing at the moment, but in any case, the idea that, you know, that we're ignoring it, we're not. This review is coming. We're very interested in this review. So I, um, it's more just about phraseology. Can I propose we await the uh, completion of the academic report? No further action pro tem is what you're saying till you get the, till the yes. reviews completed. Right, so I've got no further action pro tem, one-off evidence session, point a reporter, reporters, or an ad hoc committee. Have I missed anything in that list? Well, I don't know how we do this then, so I think... Um, Can I make a comment just on... Uh, I proposed ad hoc committee before... For probably precisely the reason that we're, we're, we're kind of situation we're in now, there is clearly an issue here. I think an early review is desirable. Uh, I don't think we have the capacity as a justice committee to do it because we're already overloaded. Right. But there an are issues, committee. which is why originally an ad hoc committee was what I, I thought would be the sensible way forward right. to tease out these issues. Right. Who wants to? I'm going to. So first of all, who wants to take further action at this stage? Yeah. Who doesn't? I'm in the most difficult position here. <laughs> I, can, I, I can. I mean, I'm. I'd like to see something in between what you're all wanting to do. Which um, my concern is that we're not had. Um, I know we've had a vote for four. We've not been able to find out if those who are aggrieved and maybe rightly grieved, have um, had any working a connection with the focus, what's it called? What's it? Focus. That's what I would like to know first, because that was something that, you know, we were saying that not all have engaged, and if they have and it's not been successful, I think that's important. <coughs> if they've really tried that and it's been a way... I mean, do you feel that we could possibly do that first and then go back to this, rather than... Um, you know, if they've engaged and it's been a waste of time, fine, we find something out. But if they've not engaged, we also find something out. Can I just make a comment? The people who were aggrieved certainly emailed all of us in great numbers. Now, they emailed us in great numbers about what they were aggrieved with. They knew the focus group was there. We could certainly have contacted them. We had the figures of people who had put in complaints and yet, when they were contacted, they never followed up. No, but what I'm and saying I is, I want to know. Enough. I want to know if they've engaged yeah, with sorry. the focus, the whatever. What's it called again? 
it's on evidence and, and well, we usually from find people out, to... We usually find out, why don't we ask um, if they've done to have written evidence, which we usually have written evidence we're before we... stringing this out for... No, we're not. I'm, I'm loath to have call people for evidence if we're going to say, did you engage with Focus? And they say no. And that's the first answer to the first question. Yeah, but there's so many more other questions than that. Surely can well, I have to say, I would like to have a one-off evidence session for the Minister of the Community. I'm prepared. I would, I would like a further explanation. I'm not content to go, I'll be honest, I don't want to go straight to review or evidence or something before we've tested it further. But I, I, I can understand that the committee is divided. I don't like it divided. And I was hoping we could have, if we get the community, Minister of Community Safety and Legal Affairs along, at least we could test that first and then we can go back to it. That's, that's where I am. If you're agreeable to us doing that, I can, we can pack it in for the day and have uh, the Minister along for a one-off evidence session. Sorry? We're going to probably have to put that to the vote. I mean, it's a difficult one. Uh, I, well, I, that's my proposal. I put my hand up for that. Who's prepared to have the Minister along first? I'm on my own. Yeah, right. Improvement on, on, what, on nothing. So. Right, so we're going to do that. That's five to four. Can so we, we'll have the minister. Foes against, please show. Five four, right? So we'll have the minister of community affairs either in 18th or 25th of February. But uh, I want to make an objection. Is you did say on your vote before you asked to vote, convener. I didn't is, vote. Is, no, but before you made you, you did say. I agree to see the minister first, and I really object to the word first, because we need to send a strong message to the people who are not engaging, but we need to engage. We can't have them out there saying, that's fine, we don't need to engage. No, no, I, well, that's all on the record, but whether or not they've engaged with it or not, we, we expect them, we wish them to do it, but our next step is, uh, the majority has said they will have the minister along for a one-off session on it. A short one-off session will be fine. Thank you very much. And the next meeting is Tuesday, 3rd December.